Welcome to the September 9th, 2015 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeal. I could stand for a pledge allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Could we uh, have a roll call? Mr. Hebert? Present. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Loisel? Mr. Stark? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. And Mr. Richard? Here. Okay, so Mr. Richard will be voting. At this point in time, Mr. Hebert, you will be voting um, unless um, Mr. Loisel gets here. Sure. As you know, we, no matter what, full participation, but the voting from that point of view will switch. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Okay. So I have a motion on approval of the August 18th minutes. Motion to approve as presented. Any discussion on the motion? Do a second? Okay, Mr. Richard. Uh, Seeing none, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Can I also have an approval on the July 8th, 2015 minutes? Motion to approve as presented. Second. And Mr. Richard, again, a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That's unanimous again. Thank you very much. Just a housekeeping note. Uh, we're, we're starting off the first appeal, 2555. It's a hardship variance re request by Rod and Michelle Dayton, 19 Vestor Street. Uh, Assessor's Map U1, Parcel 24. But uh, I wasn't here at the last meeting. The chairman at the last meeting was Mr. Soizel. He is on his way. Um, if I wanted him to be uh, at this meeting, I thought it was important that uh, he had a lot of good questions. I've seen the uh, video, so I know it took place. Uh, but he'll also be coming in. When he comes in, uh, he'll be taking the position of a voting member at that point. And uh, just to let you know that he is coming. And we started off last last time. I know the does anybody that was here, Mr. Stark, your other projecting chair, were you here last week? I was week? not here last month. Um, anybody that was here that wants to give an overview of what happened last week, or last month? Chairman Maroon, should we maybe j just hold that one until the second? Second appeal, and uh, he says he's going to be right along. I was going to do oh, that, okay. but I just talked to him in the parking lot. Oh, perfect. So, if no one, does, you you okay with giving an overview? Well, maybe Brian might do a better job than I. Oh, you want to do it? It's okay. um, yep, I'm I'm basically going to read from my staff comments. Um, That's perfect. Um, this is, uh, this appeal was tabled at the August 18th uh, hearing. Uh, because the board wished to see uh, some lot coverage calculations and driveway location on the site plan, and as well as to provide the designer with a, an opportunity to revise the floor plan and elevations to address concerns about the massing of the structure on the parcel in relation to the neighboring properties in the property line. Um, the property is in the shoreland overlay and erosion hazard area. Um, the relief that's uh, the relief is requested because of the desire to remove the two existing cottages and construct one single-family dwelling. Um, see, the board felt fairly strongly that the appellant was not meeting the burden of proof for cr criteria C, which is the one that says you will not alter the essential character of the locality. Um, um, although the revised plan that was submitted days later um, does reduce the building height by approximately two feet uh, by flattening out the roof pitch, and it removes the third floor bedroom in favor of storage space, um, staff still does not see how the revised design is substantially different from the previous design as far as the massing, number of uses and rooms, and overall building style. Further, the design doesn't appear to move in the direction of the character-based zoning code that is currently being proposed in draft form and includes a range of building types, lot placement standards, building dimensions, components, different porch styles, additions and wings, um, that are based on the specific character of Higgins Beach, rooted from the input that we received uh, by their neighborhood in uh, earlier meetings this summer. Um, we realize that the timing of the code amendments is not ideal for the applicant who seeks to start construction this fall, um, but staff suggests that the character of development in Higgins Beach has been well documented through the mm -hmm. code repair process to date and um, are available in both closing presentation and design <coughs> video in June and draft 
character code currently available online on the website. This material should provide a fairly clear direction on a range of building designs, form styles, architectural components, et cetera. Um, so I expect that um, Mr. Fisher uh, and Mr. Wilson are going to provide some explanation as to the, the revisions that they've made to both the site plan and the floor plan uh, in, in an attempt to try to better meet those uh, design criteria. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Fisher, would you like to, uh, to give an overview at this point of what the changes are that you've made or what the proposals yes. are and how, how it varies? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jim Fisher from Northeast Civil Solutions uh, representing Mr. and Mrs. Dayton. <coughs> Mr. Dayton is here with us this afternoon. Uh, along with Mr. Wilson, who is the designer, and I'd be happy to go over that. If it please the board, I'd like to be uh, pursuant to a meeting that we had with Brian yesterday. Um, I'd like to be able to pass out just a couple of sheets. You've already got the information, uh, or, n or nothing has changed as far as uh, design is concerned, but they do have the calculations, uh, the additional calculations that Brian had asked for. Um, so I'll just take the, uh, you can refer to these as you wish, but the designs that you already have are still applicable. Um, also, <laughs> just, for the, uh, chairs. just for the record, Mr. Lazell is now here. Thank you. Interruption. Um, for the benefit of the people in the audience, it's just basically what uh, you're doing. You're seeing this plan on the uh, on the viewing screen. The only difference is that there is a we added a, a couple of uh, um, new calculations that uh, were requested by staff that are down in the lower right hand corner. Other than that, the plan doesn't change. So, to recap, since most of us were here last time, uh, essentially from a zoning perspective. Uh, notwithstanding the architectural design at the moment. What we have is a property in Vesper Street that a, a structure, it's a 50 by 100 uh, foot property, slightly parallelogram, so it's a little bit less than 5,000 square feet. Uh, we're proposing the teardown of the two structures that are currently on that uh, parcel. As you may remember, the board members may remember, we were here in the late winter and uh, attempting to uh, functionally divide those properties and the board suggested that that wouldn't necessarily be the most uh, apropos way to be able to do that uh, and suggested that uh, the owners at the time may want to market that as a uh, market the property as a two family property, as a two structure parcel, uh, which they subsequently did and were able to sell it to the Daytons who were actually looking, uh, who are in Scarborough and were actually looking for a parcel, uh, particularly at Higgins Beach, on which they could put a, uh, a principal structure with another dwelling unit, uh, euphemistically referred to as an ADU, uh, for their adult daughter who needs some additional care uh, and they need to be able to live there uh, with their daughter. So again, from a zoning perspective, I believe Brian also checked with corporate counsel and that's not an issue. And we went through that a little bit last time. Uh, also, as far as zoning is concerned, what we've done is uh, relative to the square footage of the uh, cottages that are still on the property at the moment, uh, we have uh, shrunk that square footage, shrunk the proposed build, and from the last time that we were here uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we shrunk the building uh, both widthwise and lengthwise, albeit relatively minorly, moved it forward on the lot to be able to increase the, uh, the backyard uh, as much as feasible. It is still further back from the um, front setback than the cur as the current uh, structure on the lot is, and it's actually narrower as well on both sides. We also took the driveway that you may remember, the current driveway that's there right now actually has encroached for the past 50 years, albeit slightly on an abutting property. Uh, we don't want to continue that forward, so we showed the driveway pursuant to the board's request. So the new driveway is uh, completely on the property. The overall impervious surface area has shrunk. Everything has basically gotten better, albeit small, or relatively um, uh, small. But uh, as far as the changes are concerned, but everything is in the right direction. It's a smaller footprint. It's uh, 
it occupies uh, less of an area on the lot than the previous, than the current setbacks or the current uh, um, cottages do. And toward that end, uh, we feel that we're back here uh, with a new design that I'll get to here in just a moment and then Mr. Wilson will speak to here shortly uh, about why we believe this is uh, meeting the criteria for the board. One of the things I would like to point out that, uh, that Brian mentioned, and he's absolutely correct, it doesn't specifically meet all the criteria for the new uh, proposed regulations that are going into Higgins Beach. One of the things toward that end I might want to mention is that uh, uh, the Dayton started working with Mr. Wilson as their designer well before the June meeting, so nobody really knew what the context of that was going to be officially, well, even semi-officially at that point, and then worked with them after that meeting prior to, to be able to come up with the design prior to the meeting that we had just uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, we do understand what the, the new guidelines are going to be as far as Higgins Beach is concerned. Uh, in the future, obviously, we're not going to be here too often, uh, if at all, asking for any variances from those particular guidelines. But at this point, we don't really <coughs> know when they're going to go into effect. Um, it's imminent, but that's a subjective term. Imminent could be given that there are a minimum of four hearings that are required, one at the planning board and three at the council. Um, this could be as early as perhaps December. It could be a year. Uh, or it could get tweaked. Can I stop you for a minute, Mr. Fisher? Yes. Um, I think the board's attitude overall is going to, we know where this is going as far as the town and what expected, what it goes on in the planning board and the town council and everything else is the, the plan is set and moving. It's not going to change much. Oh, that's not the, the issue. It's, uh, it's it, the timing. But they don't have to necessarily, I guess what I'm getting at is if this is, I guess if the argument, which I'm hearing, and I don't want to waste a lot of time, but if the argument is, we started this before that change, that doesn't cut it. Okay. I mean, I just mentioned that the design started before anybody really knew what was going on. I think if they'd broken ground, that'd be a different conversation. Okay. Yep. But I don't want to, I don't want to tie into the point where, I just don't want to, I don't believe anybody here would believe that as a reasonable statement. Is that fair? No, it's just background. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that that was a, we know where it's going. It's been done. We've been talking about it for a long time. Oh, yeah. No, it's so ahead, thank you. you it, I didn't mean that as an argument. It's more of no. a background information as okay. to when the Dayton's acquired the property and when they started doing the designing. Um, so when we were here last time, uh, the couple of board members that weren't here, the building was determined to be too big, uh, especially as viewed from one of the sides, which was you know, a relatively flat side. What I would like to point out, however, is there's a few things here that are somewhat beyond our control. And we talked a little bit about this last time, and I'd just like to bring it up again. Uh, one of those aspects is because the property is partially in the shoreland zone and from a different direction, partially <coughs> in the erosion hazard area, it has to be on pi, it meaning any structure in that, uh, any new structure uh, or addition to an existing structure in those areas has to be elevated above that plane with three feet of freeboard. In other words, it has to be elevated essentially uh, close to five feet before we can even get to the finished floor. So we understand that the concept of a two-story house, and that's all this is, it's just a simple two-story house, uh, what that means essentially is that we can't, where m many other people can start counting their two stories at grade, we have to be five feet up before we can even begin. Uh, given that, where most people have, many people, many houses, have the utilities, particularly the furnace, the hot water heater, et cetera, uh, in their basements, not all, but many. We don't have a basement because of this. We don't even have an enclosed area in which we can put something that would be relatively free of the elements. This is a free and clear underneath wind, sand, and water goes right through the bottom of this uh, foundation, as it were. So we start at five feet up. We've got to have some place to be able to put these utilities and storage that would otherwise go in a foundation or at least in a frost wall foundation that's relatively secured. Again, in this case, we don't have that. So those utilities are going to be going in the attic. Now, the attic has been brought down. It used to have an actual third floor bedroom up there. We've gotten rid of that completely. Uh, the pitch of the roof is lower than it was. It's, it's made that way to accommodate not only basic storage, but um, also the, the hot water, well, the, the utilities that go there. So essentially what we're looking at is a house that is indeed only two stories. It's got less of a steep new roof than we had before, and it is smaller all around and occupies less space, including uh, the square footage that's within the shoreland zone, which is the information that I just passed out to you this evening. Uh, the only addition, again, was that under that chart is the area in the shoreland zone, uh, which Brian and I, when we had a meeting yesterday, he pointed that out. So what we've done is by bringing the, the structure forward, albeit slightly, 
uh, we've actually decreased the amount that the proposed uh, house that we're looking at right now than is currently there in the shoreland zone. So every way you look at this from a technical perspective is better. S smaller, less wide, not further, further back from, the, uh, from all uh, setbacks, in fact, uh, including the rear. So it meets all that criteria, notwithstanding the fact that it's still a good sized house. But what I would ask you to take a look at is the series of photographs that I sent that uh, we took and uh, have given to you uh, just briefly. This gets to, as Brian had mentioned, criteria number three that we've gone through last time about uh, character of the neighborhood or locality. Uh, you'll see that, uh, well, you won't see specifically from the photographs, but other than this property that we're talking about right now, on this entire block of Vesper Street, on both sides of the road of Vesper Street, the entire block, there's only one house that's one story. All other houses there are at least two stories, and some are higher than that. The three picture, or the two or three pictures that you see at the back of this little photographic portfolio are in the same block but on the other street. So as far as character of neighborhood and locality is concerned, one-story houses don't cut it. This is a two-story house. It looks a little bit higher. It is a little bit higher because of the floodplain. But anybody who comes here, or any town for that matter from now on, uh, especially when the new FEMA regulations go into effect, the floodplain regulations, are going to have to start at that three feet of freeboard or almost five feet above the plane. Given that, you know where we're going. Um, we think that this is a, uh, a relatively nice two-story house, which is all that there is there. Uh, and toward that end, I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have later, but I'd like Mr. Wilson to be able to come up and speak to this uh, architecturally a bit in terms of the changes from last time. Mr. Wilson? Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Yes, Walt Wilson from Design Company. <coughs> we did make a few changes to the plan, like Jim had referred to. Um, I think the elevation, um, I think the critical elevation that was discussed last time was left elevation. If you look at that, it has a uh, um, less of a mass than what the other one had before. Um, I do want to reiterate that whatever the size of the building is that's on the plans, whether the first one we had or the one we're coming up now, are less than what the maximum height allowance is on that zone. Um, so we aren't trying to increase the height of the building beyond what's allowed. And when I say what's allowed, we're talking about what DEP allows, which is 35 feet to the top of the roof. Uh, the uh, local ordinance is 35 feet to the average of the roof, which means the building could actually be about five or six feet higher under the local ordinance. But DEP is the governing body on this. The building that we have now in square footage is less than square footage in size than what the existing buildings on the property are. So we are not trying to add any additional square footage other than what we are already allowed to have. Now, what we're allowed to have, uh, I believe it's somewhere around 1,740 feet, is greater than what the um, percentage of lot coverage in that zone is with DEPs involved. However, the exception to that is you're allowed to have an amount of lot coverage equal to what's existing on the property now. Um, so we have two cottages, two separate living units on the property. We're going to combine the second unit into the first. Uh, if you look under your uh, accessory use definitions in the ordinance, uh, it says when that is done, uh, the board and the town would like to see that the unit is put into the house so it looks like it's part of one house and not two separate houses. Uh, that's one of the things you have to do. Uh, I think this thing satisfied that requirement 100% because most people look at it think it's a single family house. And actually, there's two units in there. Uh, so I think we've satisfied that. Also, like Jim referred to, the sideline setbacks that we propose are actually further in than what the existing structures on the property are. So all the way around with meeting square footage lot coverage or meeting setbacks based on what's existing on the lot, we're, we're less than the height than what's allowed in the zone. Everything seems to fit into the guidelines we have to go by. Um, now, when it comes down to the architectural side, one of the things going to the boards, and I used to sit on the board, 
is a section that deals with the character of neighborhood. The zoning board primarily defines character dimensionally, not aesthetically. Um, so the character of the neighborhood has to do with the building is located on lots, what the setbacks are, and so forth. It's not an architectural review definition. It's a dimensional definition that sets the character. Um, do you have large open lots? Do you have small lots or houses close to the lot lines? That's the character of the neighborhood. Um, aesthetically is, is, is a whole different ballgame. Some towns have aesthetic boards, architectural review boards. Scarborough doesn't have that. Um, so in dealing with the character, we believe that the building as proposed fits the character of the area, um, close sidelines and so forth. This building actually sits back several feet further on the sidelines than what the existing buildings do. Um, on top of that, there's been this discussion about this new change coming to Scarborough. <coughs> well, under state law and court cases, you cannot decide this on something that has not yet been put into effect. You have to decide it on what the current ordinances are. And anything that may be proposed, we even don't even know what it's going to be. It's still in rough draft form. None of those things should be allowed to be any decision on, on what the board's looking at here. You have to look at what the rules are that we came in front of the board with. So with the, I want to stop you there. The rules are the four criteria. Yeah, exactly. So that's what we lose, and so exactly. we're okay with understanding what the rules right. are. Right. It's just that over the process, I have been told uh, things that, for example, tell your client to, to wait until a new thing comes into effect. Uh, don't go by what's existing now. Wait until you have something else to go by. I, I think and that was for advice because of the potential of, of I think, what you got from that. I don't think that was intentionally to hurt you. I think that the concern is, as I watched the meeting, this was not a very popular plan last month. Last month, And I think the intent was to give you guys some room if you had it so that you didn't get a no. Well, I bring it up because Brian read that letter, and two-thirds of that letter dealt with complying with the future things that's being proposed, right. which aren't in effect now. And that was one of the things we were getting run up against last time. Go ahead. I'll let you continue. Well, we should be looking at what the existing ordinances are, not what they might be changed to. So in that respect, we believe we satisfy all the requirements of the existing ordinance. And the only reason we're here asking for the variances is that we're closer to the sidelines than what the existing ordinance says. However, we are further back than what the existing buildings are, so we're increasing the setbacks. And we believe we meet all the requirements other than that. Uh, no, it was brought up to me that the porch on the side of the house in the front, it should be in the front of the house. But again, that's getting into the proposed ordinances that may be coming, not the existing ones the way they are now. And so in review of the, of the plans, we made some changes a little bit um, to, um, it's basically the same size and shape of house. Okay, other than the third floor, we did change the roof line, especially on that left side. Did away with a, a hip roof dormer that was up there. And we did, I did reduce the roof pitch down to, I think it's eight and a half, I believe. Um, <laughs> but here, here comes the, the, the thing I, I, I mentioned last time, where you were trying to get me to hit a moving target. Under the new ordinance, that roof pitch is too low. It has to be at least a 912 under that proposed ordinance that's coming through. So <clears throat> there are things that we had to make a change for uh, to satisfy some of the things last time. Uh, but I believe that the, the, the character of the building, dimensional characters, meet the neighborhood. Um, I will also bring up to the board the fact that a house of actually slightly larger than this was approved last fall from the board on the same size lot at Higgins Beach. It had a higher roof pitch, and it was a single-family house, not a two-family. So when you start looking at what, what we're presenting here, it's nothing that is out of the ordinary as far as what the board uh, approved for um, from my company on similar lots at Higgins Beach. Thank you very much. Um, 
Do you have letters on those phone calls? The phone calls letters. Um, anything you'd like to have? No, I think we're pretty clear on where we stand. Okay. Uh, why don't I open up to the board for questions? I got questions. So, so. Um, what is the dimension in the view that I see right here from the left hand to the right hand side of the building, from the front to the back? What is that dimension? I'd have to look at the plans. If you would be so kind. I don't know if I can get that dimension on those plans because I don't have a. If you could give me a ballpark, that's close enough. A ballpark? Yep. 65 feet. And I'm saying any of the photos that you show me, that you've shown me this evening, I want you to show me a house that has a 65 foot dimension that goes front to back or even side to side. I just, I just mentioned the house you approved last year. They moved in two months ago. Is it's 68 feet deep. Where is it located compared to this? Uh, it's three streets over on, on That's my point. It's three streets over. So it's the, the same locality. In, in my opinion, if you look at the neighborhood, in this area, which is not three streets away, this does not fit the character because that dimension will dwarf all the homes that are next to it. To me, that breaks the character, and I cannot approve that. That makes no sense to me. You I've asked to, you, you have to look let at me this finish, phone. please. It's not a single Let me finish, house. please. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Excuse me for being rude, but I want to finish my statement. That is a massive structure compared to the ones next to it. And that's the problem with the character question. You're looking broadly at the entire neighborhood, which is every house down there. <coughs> if we made a mistake in the past, we cannot change that. What I'm saying is we have learned from our past mistakes, and we believe that that is a mistake, allowing that to happen. <coughs> so in the future, which started, I would say, several months ago, we have changed, I'm speaking for myself, I have changed my attitude. So if the expectation is now that I'm going to approve that, the answer will be no. And I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm just going to talk about reasonable return at first, if that's okay. If you look at the main municipal site and they talk about reasonable return, if you read the question, it says, and I don't have my glasses, so please bear with me. Um, it will have... Uh, storage building or addition of the existing structure. Thank you very much. Will have to be denied on the basis of the e economic return standard absent proof that the person has tried to sell the property as is and no one will buy it unless the proposed construction can occur. In my opinion, that statement is saying unless this proposed construction can occur. You're coming to us with a plan. And that plan is what you're going to build by because as soon as you agree to it, that's the structure that's going to exist. So under this statement, when it says the proposed, it means this proposed. And I'm saying with that dimension, you are trying to mass maximize return and not fit it on the lot. Now I know as engineers and architects, you have demands or requests by the customer. You're trying to meet those. I get it. I have those same things where I work. But in order for us to approve it, it has to fit and pass these four questions, and I don't think it passes reasonable return. Can I answer that? Certainly. Okay. First of all, it's not one family house. It's two units. Mm -hmm. When you put two units together, you get a bigger piece of house. We are allowed two units on this lot. We are allowed 1,740 square feet. Grandfather. State allows, DEP allows it, 1,740 square feet of lot coverage. We're allowed two units to be put in the building, not one. So automatically with two units, the building gets bigger. Now you bring up the reasonable return. And I'm going to answer that maybe in a different way that you look at it. Mm -hmm. When the applicant purchased this house, or this property. And what date was that, by the way? Um, five, six months ago, March, okay? Um, after looking at several pieces. The 1,740 existing lot coverage is grandfathered. We knew we could have 1,740 square feet of building on the site. That's number one. 
the reasonable return aspect also relies on release, reuse, uh, reasonable use of the land. So with 1,740 feet of existing structure, the reasonable use of that land would have up to 1,740 square feet. To make it any less than that, you would design to denying reasonable use of a property that already has a grandfathered lot size coverage. So by saying that the house is too big and doesn't fit the neighborhood, it does. Because we are actually a little bit less than what the actual uh, lot coverage is. We aren't trying to maximize the use. Maximize would be trying to get more than what's allowed. We aren't trying to do that. We are working with a figure that's an allowed figure. Now with that allowed figure and putting the plan together, we come up with less that's allowed. So we have actually demonstrated that we are not trying to maximize the whole use. And that if the board takes and says it's too big, you've got to make it smaller, you are denying the applicant reasonable use of the land that's grandfathered in size already. So when it comes to cannot yield a reasonable return without a variance, we need the variance not because of the size. We need the variance because of the setbacks. And that's all. And the variance we are requesting put the building further in from the lot lines than what's existing now. So we're increasing the setbacks on the property. On the left side of the property, I think one part of the building is only four feet from the line. On the new building, we're nine feet from the line. So we aren't asking to maximize return. We're just asking to use what's grandfathered and allowed, both by state and town statute. So based on that, you're saying you are reducing the square footage that is being used? Slightly. Uh, what about the usable square footage under that roof compared to what it was in the two buildings? Oh, there's a lot more usable square footage. But don't forget, we, are, we have a light height restriction that we're allowed to use. We aren't exceeding the height restriction. You, you, what I'm saying is you're canting it in your direction because it works for you. I, I know what you're saying. But then what I'd say is, okay, I'll let you sit with that, that footprint but use the same cubic footage in the house. No, and, that's, and then that's I'll be happy nowhere, with that's it. nowhere in the ordinance at all. And I agree with you, it's not. Nowhere in the ordinance. But, and there's nowhere in the ordinance where it says just because you're keeping it under the square footage that it's less usable or more usable space. And I'm saying it's more usable space, congratulations, but I'm saying the mass of that elevation does not fit in the character of the neighborhood. So well, I don't agree depends. with you. If you're denying, if you're, if you're looking at the neighborhood as the abutting properties or a house or two away, I might agree with you, except the house right across the street has got an addition on the back that's three stories high. And it has that same mass? It has that dimension when you look at it. Goes it goes front to back on the lot. And what's the dimension? Give me I a don't know. I, I, I didn't go over and measure his house. Yeah. I don't know. N neither do I. But I'm saying... But I know it doesn't meet any of the setbacks. And it's on a 50 by 100 lot. Um, I, I can't control what was done at that time. I, I can't, well, I can't what, do that. Well, what was done at that time in the past set up the character of Higgins Beach. I'm saying that, th okay, I think we can agree to disagree. I don't think you're going to convince me to change my mind, so I'm only one vote. Well, I'm I know, fine but with what that. you're saying is you'd like to see a smaller house on a smaller footprint. And all I'm saying, that's denying the applicant reasonable return. And I don't agree, because I think it can still meet what they need, but I, I think that elevation is a problem. I don't. Okay. We're allowed to disagree. And here, here we're in the difference between character, which is dimensional, and aesthetics, which is visual. Mm -hmm. Visual. There's nothing in the board on, on aesthetics. It's all in character, which is dimensional. It depends on how you define character. Let's, uh, let's stop it there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yep. Other points? Uh, yeah. Uh, what were the dimensional changes? You said there were changes on the side setback and the front setback and the roof line. You said there were minor changes, but I want the dimensions on those. Um, Can you read it for me? Sorry. Oh, I've got the glasses. Sorry. I can so. Yeah. The community glasses. Which chart are we looking at? Okay. One of those just passed out. Is that one right? The ones that just passed out, right? Um, as far as the uh, the question was, uh, just read out the uh, the coverage. Um, 
uh, table that's already on the, uh, on the plan. Oh, the building area that's existing right now is 1,740 square feet. The proposed area, this is the footprint, is 1,700, uh, 1,718 square feet. It goes from 35.1% of existing coverage down to 34.7%. The overall impervious area, which is just a, as an interest to note, um, the existing is 2,388 square feet. These are the middle figures that are on that chart. For a 48.2% coverage, the proposed is 2167 for a 43.7 <coughs> coverage, considerably less. The area in the shoreland zone, which is the back left of the property as you're standing on the road looking at it, uh, is currently is 538 square feet in the shoreland zone, and the proposed is uh, 528 square feet, which is 26%. So everything is less. Now, to answer your question specifically, what we did in order to be able to make this happen was to uh, bring a, this meaning getting it out of the shoreland zone or, or moving it um, away from the shoreland zone to the extent that it uh, has less of a current, either equal to or less of a current footprint. So what we did there was we brought the house forward uh, by a little less than two feet. So what we're looking at now is, and I've got these figures for you, this was just pursuant to the, the meeting that we had yesterday. Um, so what we have today is pursuant to any uh, just further discussion of the board and, and uh, hopefully a, a favorable consideration, but whatever it might be, uh, the house even being brought forward is still further back on the lot than the existing cottage is right now. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, I'd like to address uh, actually, I'm not sure. I think you know, Mr. Loisel may have brought this up about 65 feet. I know we're, we're, we're kind of uh, barking up two different trees here to a certain extent, but if we were to table this again and come back with a new design pursuant to the new regulations, if, when they, uh, let's call it what it is, they're going to come into effect. We just don't know exactly when. Um, but the regulations, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, are proposing a 25-foot rear setback and a 10-foot front setback, 8 to 10 feet, actually. So if we do the math, you've got a 100-foot deep lot, minus 25 feet, 75 feet, minus 10 feet from the front is 65 feet. So you're right, 65 feet is a fairly long building. Even under the new criteria, it would fit in that building envelope. With, so one, with one exception, Jim, the 10 foot would only be for those um, attachments to the main building. The main core of the right. building has to be 18. I think, the, I think the range that they're talking about right now is 18 to 20 feet. Absolutely. Uh, and I, can, I agree, and, and you're right. And, and that's um, why, as far as that know, core the porch, is concerned. you can't enjoy that 10 foot setback. I'm sorry, say that again. Without the porch, you can't enjoy that 10 oh, foot Right, setback. exactly. But, but what I'm getting at. clear about. I don't want it to be misrepresented. No, I appreciate that. Um, I, I missed that. Could you explain that to me again, please? With the, I don't want to get into too much of the weeds of the new regulations because, as Mr. Wilson's already said, they're not into effect. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to push applicants now to try to mirror some of those things in their designs so that we don't continue to exacerbate and, and diminish the character of Higgins Beach as it's already been diminished in the past with some of these huge structures. So. What the, the new regulations are going to say is that your core building, your base, your box, okay, the main part of the building would be 18, I think it's 18 to 20, don't quote me, it's, it's in that 18 foot range. That would be the front street setback, if you will. Then if you want to add a porch, whether it's an enclosed porch, an open porch, or whatever, a wraparound porch, that can encroach into that front setback up to 10 feet. Okay. So you could have an 8 foot porch. So in essence, that, 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 that would also allow for scaling. Yeah, and yeah. That, what that does is it scales the height of the building up from the sideline so that you don't get a towering effect next to the property line. Which is exactly, Which is exactly what this is. So okay. it's, it's also in our, the R4 zone, it defines it that way. Right. And as I mentioned last time, the ordinance states that if a building is to be 30 feet height, higher than 30 feet, it, has, it can only be, uh, the setback has to be 50% at least 50% of that height. So at 30 feet, you're 15, and that would be a compliant building. You wouldn't need to be here to do that. But 
if you were going to have it be 35 feet height, with, which is the maximum height, you, you'd have to be 17 and a half feet back from the sideline. If you apply that same ratio going toward the property line, um, if you're at eight feet, your eave height couldn't be more than six, or your building height rather couldn't be more than 16 feet high. So that's if if you apply that same rationale, this doesn't cut it in that regard. Um, there's a couple other things, Jim, I want to mention while we're while we're on the subject. Um, I did go out and I checked some impervious surface, surface um, what you're calling impervious surface, I call non-vegetated surface. Um, I only came up with about 500 square feet. I don't, I don't know what you came up with. That, that's non-building, non-vegetated surface. Obviously, the buildings are included in that. Mm -hmm. um, I just measured the driveways, and basically, that was just all that was showing that wasn't growing grass, okay? And I, I, I was generous, and I got 500 square feet. So okay. uh, I also totaled up the existing buildings that were there, and I came up, and, and I measured to the eaves just because because the new regulations that are going to be in effect now define footprint to include the eaves. All my life I've been calling footprint the foundation. Now it's going to be the eaves of the building. So I'm These, I'm these do include that. And, and, and I came up with, for the existing buildings, I came up with 1,848.7 square feet. There's quite a difference between, and that's actually, I mean, that's kind of a good thing because yeah, that great. works in your favor. Huh. We'll take it. However, I also totaled up the way. new structure, and that's 1,825.6 square feet, and that's less than 0.5% difference, and that didn't include the deck or the steps. So I'm not, I guess I'd like to see some itemized calculations because I'm not sure that we're on the same page there. I also totaled up what area of the building was in the shoreland zone, and, and I came, and again, it was kind of hard to, to read the eye chart, but I used some of Walt's dimensions here, and uh, you know, unfortunately this plan shrunk down too, so I couldn't scale where there wasn't dimensions. And I'm taking that shoreland zone line that cuts diagonally through the building, okay, and I came up with roughly 900 square feet, 909.8 to be exact, uh, of that building that's in the shoreland zone. The existing building, um, I've got 651.8, uh, uh, which is pretty much the whole cottage, the whole back cottage. Yeah, I think, I, if I may, just for clarity's sake, I think what Brian is referring to is everything, everything that you see in blue in this sort of trapezoidal triangle here is the shoreline zone. That's great. That's a good il illustration. For that. Um, what you see in green, um, I'm hoping you can see it all, uh, is what's there now in the shoreline zone. And then what you see in orange is the portion of the proposed structure that would go into that shoreline zone. So the figures that you're looking at, again, are down here in this lower right. I know it's really tough to see on those, but uh, again, the, the, exact, the existing building structure, and this is all from AutoCAD. So when we measured up everything pursuant to the survey and then we calculate the area within that, we get the existing building at 538 square feet and the proposed portion, this orange uh, highlighted section of the building that uh, was proposed to go there, it's actually 10 square feet less than that at 528, just the math. Yeah, I just can't understand how I could drop 100 and over 100 square feet of building, physically measuring it on the ground from AutoCAD, because, I mean, that's not going to change. You slid the building forward, and that's going to change. Oh, that's the probably the why, yeah. Well, that, that would explain some of that difference on the new building, but you're not moving the old building, and I right. don't understand how I can come up with 651 and you've got 538 if we're both measuring the eaves. That, that's a little disturbing to me. <laughs> come on over. We'll show you how we did it. <laughs> Why don't you um, come out in the field? We'll measure it together. <laughs> sure. No, I'd be happy to do that. that. That's not an issue as far as we're concerned. I mean, it's, I think from the existing to the proposed, the, the point is, um, well, I'd stick behind the figures, but um, it's less than what is proposed, <coughs> albeit slightly, is indeed less than what it is. If we include the eaves, which would explain the higher figures, then uh, on both structures... Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said you did include the eaves. We did, but if you include those eaves on both structures, it's just going to go up proportionately. So the, right. the, the amount that's less is still less. Um, so toward that end, in the shoreland zone, and as you're probably aware, in the shoreland zone, if you're over 20 percent, you can't go over 20 percent if it's new structure, a new construction, unless you're replacing uh, something that's already constructed in that zone that's a greater footprint. So we're actually 
um, diminishing that new footprint, albeit slightly, but we are going in the right direction toward that end. Um, one of the other things, and I won't highlight this anymore because, again, those regulations aren't in effect, and uh, you're absolutely correct about the porches, uh, getting just back to the, the new regulations regarding the core building. Uh, what, what I meant to say was that as far as the 65-foot, yes, this is a big building. <coughs> Let's call it what it is for the neighborhood. Excuse me. It's not outsized in terms of what's allowed, but it doesn't, you know, when, it, when you put it up against the, literally the cottage right next door, which is a smaller cottage, you have a small cottage and a bigger house. Is that compatible? Yeah. <coughs> It depends on who you're asking and, and uh, what the situations are at the time. Uh, the issue is, as Walt, and, and I won't repeat this again either, but uh, as Walt had mentioned then, is we're going by the criteria that we have to go by now. Uh, we've heard what's going on. I've attended every one of these meetings as far as Hagen's Beach is concerned. Uh, for what it's worth, I think it's great for the most part. Uh, and it's going to go into effect at some point. When that is, unfortunately, our client in this particular case who purchased the property about five months ago can't really afford to wait for that or shouldn't afford to wait to that because time is money and they wanted to try to be in this house as their principal domicile uh, by next spring. It could conceivably still happen with a favorable opinion of the board because their contractors are lined up for this month. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. We understand that. Uh, but the point being is that we can't really afford to wait too long for something to go into effect that might take a fair amount of time yet to do so. So we are somewhat stymied by the regulations. And, and I know that this throws everybody for a loop because during this three months, four months ago for another several months, we're all kind of in a state of limbo waiting for something to get actually become official. So that as Walter had said earlier, we're kind of trying to hit a moving target. Well, that target's going to slow down and stop eventually. But the eventuality could be a ways away yet. And again, we have a client, as, as uh, uh, Brian had mentioned, we, I think it was Brian, who we do have you know clients that we try to uh, to adhere to their designs as much as possible within reason of the regulations and then coming here um, if those regulations need a variance. So toward that end, again, we're just proposing what we think is a relatively uh, not small but fits in the character of the neighborhood type of house at two stories. Uh, one of the other things I would mention, um, somebody was just mentioning about the, uh, the criteria that we have to deal with in terms of uh, the, the character regarding the roof lines and coming in uh, the higher we go. Uh, everybody to whom I've spoken, just about everybody of a technical nature to whom I've spoken who deals with the regulations, has said we get the fact that this regulation is going to change, this meaning the Higgins Beach regulation, but neither the town, well basically because the town can't do this, but uh, neither the, the state nor the federal government have caught up with having to rise above the floodplain. So we're kind of in this catch-22 where our roof line would be five feet lower than it is right now if we didn't have to be five feet above the air, or above the air, five feet above the ground as far as the floodplain is concerned. That's not something that any of us here could actually deal with, whether we wanted to or not, because it's not at this level. That's at the federal level. So we're again stymied by saying you'd have a house that's basically 28 feet high if we could build it the way most people build their houses. We can't do that. And nobody going forward with new construction is going to be able to. So the regulation just hasn't caught up to design yet. That's part of the problem that we've got. Just one of the problems, but that's part of it. And until it does, which given FEMA will probably be a couple of years, we're going to be in limbo that way as well. We just have to deal with it. A lot of the uh, a lot of the utilities, though, that you've got utility rooms for, could be mounted on the bottom of the structure and still allow the f uh, the passage of sand through that foundation. Correct? Nope. Um, FEMA does not allow that. When, when you've got a floodplain where you have the uh, free movement of wind, sand, and water through that, the only thing that's allowed is a catch system, which is the uh, the pillar basically through which the conduit and the plumbing would go. Um, no, and the no, you pillar. can no. You're wrong. You can mount the utilities on the floor. Uh, you can do that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. We've been told completely the opposite that you cannot have um, any impediment. Okay. Well, come see me tomorrow because that's that's false. Okay. I'd love to be able to do that because that that can change things on a lot of different projects. But other than that catch, we've been told by FEMA uh, and by the State Floodplain Management Agency that you can't have anything underneath. You can store stuff and you can put your kayaks there and your bicycles or whatever. Mm -hmm. but you cannot have any permanent structure below that lowest horizontal support choice. And we've been told that for years. Not, I'm not disputing. If you've yeah, got something no, that I, says the contrary, I that's great. I don't think that that's right. I'd love to see it because that can change a lot of what we're doing. But heretofore, we've been 
adhering to that. So, and that's the guidance that we've had both federally and from the state level. Mr. Fisher, from, from the last time you were before us last month to the new floor plan we're seeing now, I mean, maybe you've addressed it, maybe I've missed it. What were the specifics that were actually changed? Uh, the house has been narrowed by a foot. It's been brought, it's been uh, narrowed sideways by a foot. It's been narrowed up by, by the lengthwise by a couple of feet. We brought it forward by a couple of feet to get it further out of the shoreland zone, and we reduced the, uh, the height uh, of the overall structure from last time to this time. How much was the height reduced by, do you know? I think it was two, two plus. It came down two feet in height, overall height. Um, but you took the third floor out, and it only yeah. came down two feet. Well, the, roof <coughs> yeah. the roof line still up, yeah. The roof line still up, The third floor is still there. It's stored right. here. Mm -hmm. This doesn't have any dormers on it anymore. There's no I, bedroom. There's I, no I living I space. I do there. want to bring to your attention on the board the difference between Scarborough's height regulation and the DEP. Uh, under the Scarborough ordinance, this house is less than 30 feet in height. I believe it's 29 foot 10 inches in height under the Scarborough ordinance because of the way they measure it to make a building height. So even though we've mentioned 35 feet, we're 33 right now to the top of the roof. DEP allows 35. The Scarborough ordinance allows 35 halfway up the roof. And with the change in the, uh, that we did, our overall building height is less than 30 feet. So the setbacks that Brian was alluding to, if you're over 30 feet, you have to have a different setback. This building is actually less than 30 feet in height. Now, to that extent, and I hate to do this, uh, bring in action or a plan that shows under the ex proposed ordinance what this building would be. Keeping in mind, we're allowed 1,740 square feet. Under the proposed ordinance. Can the cam you know, camera get that? We have a house that can be 36 feet deep. We have an addition that can go on to the back of the house as long as you stepped in at least a foot from each side. And we have what they call the carriage house in the back, two stories. On the proposal, it can be 18 feet wide, 24 feet deep. This adds up to a total of 1,734 square feet. It produces a building front to back that is 73 feet in length under the proposals that are being rough draft. Under the rough draft, we could have a longer house than what we're proposing now. But you can see it becomes boxy. We don't want just a big two and a half story box house. This could be two and a half stories in height. You can have shed dormers, a dormers on top of it. And it can be up to 35 feet in height to the ridge. So one of the proposed rough draft that Brian's talking about, you can have a house of 73 feet in length. So this whole thing about we aren't complying to what may be coming down in the future and the house is too big, under the new proposal, we can be bigger. Question, Walt, Mr. Wilson, is that taking into account the shore land zone? Yes. This, okay. It does. And it's elevated on uh, <coughs> islands the same way. And uh, like I say, you can have roof domes up on the top. And the roof pitch can go to 912 minimum up to 1412 maximum <coughs> under the proposal that's been rough drafted. So, and you wouldn't be before us asking for side setbacks? Wouldn't be before you would walk in and get a building permit. Yeah. First, first thing, there's no second dwelling allowed in the shoreland zone if it's new construction. So that, that we are grandfathered for that already. Yeah, but that goes away for other properties. Right, but not for this property. So I just want to bring that to the attention of the board. I don't want to talk about what could be coming, but based on what we've got coming, we could have a bigger house. Be a box, the box roof, no character. And when you're talking about the character, if you want to look at it aesthetics-wise, that would have none. It'd be a two and a half story square box house with no character. And I think, in my opinion, in looking at what could be coming, 
and what we're going by, I think what we're proposing is fine. You know, if I was in a court case, I'd say I'd rest my case. Mr. <laughs> um, so Lizell, I know you've got more questions, but let me let some of the board, other board members speak. No, I got my answers from uh, from what uh, okay. Leroy asked. Brian, is the uh, is the 35 feet? Is that supposed to be from the bottom of the house or from from or from the ground? In the shoreland zone, it's from the average lowest side, the average grade at the lowest side to the highest point of the roof, excluding chimneys, antennas, and other things that stick out. Okay. And you're currently at 38 feet, is that correct? Uh, we'd be at uh, 37. 37. 30, just 37 and change. I think to, to Mr. Wilson's comment, I mean, you, you could Excuse have something. Excuse me, th there would be, th I'm sorry. I'm told that thought. Sure. Um, we're actually at 32 feet 33. right now. If it's say again, 33. Three, 33 sorry, from, from that, that would up. be the addition if we okay. if we held the DEP standard and then went up to what Scarborough would allow, based on this roof pitch, we could get the 37 and change. But we don't want to come and we're not there. It's five feet lower than that. Sorry. That's okay. I I think to Mr. Wilson's comment, we're still struggling with two questions on this. Even if we go with both and you folks may not have to come before us, so it may not be something we'd have to struggle with at that point. But you've still got the first question of reasonable return, and you've got the question of altering the essential character of the neighborhood. I mean, we're still looking at that. We would still be looking at that if the other one came before us. If it didn't come before us, obviously, we wouldn't have to look, look at it. But we're still having to look at those two questions. And that's the toughest thing, I think, that most board members are going to have a problem getting past, is those two questions. I understand, um, and obviously I'm here to try to convince you that this is uh, correct. We don't take everything that's, uh, that, that's asked of us, because some of them are just, there's no way that it's going to get to this. I wouldn't even bring it to the board. But, uh, but in some cases, such as this one, we just think it's, it's potentially reasonable, the subjective uh, interpretation, to be sure. Uh, as far as character of the neighborhood, and I'll come back to, well, we can go through this, actually, when we go through the, uh, sure. through the notes. Uh, one other thing, Mr. Chairman, if it pleases the board, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Dayton, and he'd like to just come up and just say a few words on his behalf as well. We'll do that. Why don't we do that at the public comment time? We'll let him go. We'll let him go first at the okay. public comment time. Okay. Just Thank so you. we have the flow going. Sure. Uh, which I think is going to be right around the corner. Uh, other uh, good. board member comments or questions at this point? So why not open the public section of the meeting, and now he may speak. So the public is. Uh, anybody else would like to speak? Uh, we'll need the name, address, and uh, we'll queue up. Uh, uh, I, hello, I think everybody. Gonna start with, I, think, I, th I think I was going to start with Mr. Dayton. That's me. Mr. and Mrs. Dayton. Yeah. Okay, please Good start. evening. Uh, my name is Rod Dayton. Um, I currently own a place at uh, Higgins Beach on Kelly Lane, and I also um, currently still uh, live in New York. I'm one of those folks that married into Higgins Beach. My wife has been coming up here for 50 years, even though she wouldn't want me to admit that to everybody. Um, Everybody in life deals with situations, and we are dealing with a situation where <clears throat> for the past two years, we take care of an adult child, not child, adult woman that, uh, that got sick. Um, and for the past two years, I personally drive up here every weekend. My wife retired early as a teacher um, down on Long Island, even though she wasn't eligible to, to come up and take care of my daughter. And it's a situation that's not going to change, and um, it's a situation that we embrace, and it's a privilege to, uh, you know, to take care of her. Um, she is 31 years old, and when Walter came over a month ago with the proposed plans, um, I saw a side of him when he sat my daughter down to explain her living space, and I just wanted to share. I haven't seen a smile like that you know, in quite some time. I purchased the property on Vesper, speaking to the professional people, and again, I, this is not my field of expertise, but when I purchased the property in the spring, I was advised that we would be able to build a home that would be able to help us in our particular situation. Uh, we are my daughter's only support system. There is no other support system. Um, her two sisters live out of state. We need the extra bedrooms when they bring their children up, which is a big help to my daughter. Um, so that's where, that's where the size of the structure comes into play. Um, 
and we were under the impression that it fit the guidelines that were in place when we purchased the property. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, anybody like to speak? Please stand up, state your name and address, and. Uh Uh, my name is Phil McGoldrick. Uh, we live at 21 Vespa Street. We're the adjoining neighbor. And I didn't have copies for everybody. Uh, my budget's not, not, not that big. Um, but I wanted people to look at those. On the back side is the addresses of those houses that are all adjoining our area. And we get back to what the context is. And as I stated at the last meeting, when the neighbor beside me at 23 wanted to build a new building, tear down the old one and build a new one, and he was only four feet from our property line, I came and spoke in favor of him because I felt what he was doing was staying in the context of what our neighborhood was. Two houses across the street have been rebuilt since then, and they can get by with two stories. Um, house out back has been rebuilt, two stories. I don't know why we can't keep this thing to two stories without playing around with hips and whatever else there, are, there is, a, is there. And I, it, it always seems to be a number game when I'm listening to what's going on here. Um, tonight somebody asked the point blank question, how long is the building? And the gentleman said 65 feet. Plan I has says 67 feet 4 inches. And the numbers that always the numbers all, don't seem to jive with what they say. Um, I got the assessor's maps for the lot coverage of um, the two buildings, and I come out with 1,531 square feet. Now, I didn't do the eaves. I didn't know we were supposed to do the eaves, so that, that would play into it. But they are projecting um, 1741 originally. Well, that's 200 square feet more. Now, if you start adding the eaves in, and my question then becomes, that, um, the zoning, the zoning um, the code, code person said that um, he, he measured them. I, belie I believe what he says, okay? But I have a hard time with some of the numbers that these people present. Um, on your first plan, they showed no driveway. And, and I thought, well, there's a reason for that. They get into the impervious surfaces. Second time, they, did, they, they were required by you to show a driveway. And they did show a driveway, nine feet long by 50 feet wide, okay? And if you look at it, it says gravel. But if you look at it real carefully, there's an arrow up above that says paved. And I get back to what somebody said earlier. They put the paved driveway, and what are you going to do? It said paved on there. But yet, if you looked at it, you got the impression that maybe it was going to be gravel. And again, they cited um, the driveways that are there now. Driveways that are there now, you can see them in the pictures, they're all grass. They're not gravel. Uh, and I, and, you know, believe me, I'm not an expert in this, okay? But I looked at the July uh, diagrams and supposedly the rear setback was 15.29, and the August one was 15.7, okay? A reduction of 4.1. The front setback was 12.65, and the setback in the August one was 12.24. The left side initially was seven feet all the way. The left side now, they've tilted the building a little bit, it's eight feet in one place and seven feet in another. The right side, 
in the July one was 8.14, and the right side was 8.06. They did change the pitch, you know, I'll give them that, but they still got that third floor. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, what happens in the future, we all know we've been there. Um, I'd ask that, I, this is the second time. We were up here the other time, and you tabled it, explained all the reasons, and, and I go along with that. But I ask this to ask you at this time to not deny it, make them come back in a year and see that they're serious about what they're doing and make a building that will conform to what you see in the neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bogan. Anybody else wish to speak? Nobody else wants to comment? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing part of the meeting. And uh, just again to confirm, there are no letters and no phone calls. Okay. And we'll come back to the board for questions. Uh, I'll fire one at you. Uh, how many bedrooms are in the in the current units now? Honestly, I don't know. But I, I do want to clarify one thing. He mentioned about the things sitting askew on the property. It's parallel with the sideline. The change on the dimension was from seven feet to eight feet. It was one dimension on that site plan. Seven feet did not get changed. You should have. And remember, those are to the roof overhangs, not to the building. So if it's eight feet to the roof overhang, it's actually nine foot three inches to the building setback. Okay. And the other dimensional changes you were talking about, a reflection of the change that we Jim has already talked to you about, about shifting the building, moving a little bit to the front, and reducing the overall width of the back of the building, which I believe before was 32 feet across with the kick out of the accessory unit. And I think that is now 31 feet, I believe. It was reduced a little bit. So those dimensional things that he was talking about have to deal with the shifting of the, of the building on the site from the last meeting. Um, the other thing I want to mention to you is you have some of the buildings in the neighborhood are small. I, I agree to that. But that doesn't mean that's the size that you can build. We can build a size up to a height to what the zoning ordinance says we can. And just because they haven't done that, that shouldn't be a penalty against our application or our claim. The other thing I want to mention is his house is up for sale. When that house gets sold and someone's going to redo something there, they're in the same situation. They've got to elevate it up, put it on piers, and they're going to rebuild the house. It's going to be different from what's there right now. Um, just to, to keep the ball rolling here and also for uh, just one of the challenges of saying we're going to follow the rules is there are two sets of rules. And realistically, this doesn't meet the current standards. So the real rules are the four criteria. That's all we've got to work with. Everything else is not a given. It's not a gift. It's not a right. It's not a luxury. It's the four criteria. So we talk a lot about we can do this and we can do that. No, you can't. That's why you're here. So I do want to keep everybody focused on the real issue. The other thing is, uh, if I could ask Mr. Um, sorry, Mr. Um, uh, Dayton, if I ask you just one question, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind taking the microphone? <coughs> Mr. Chair, while he's taking the microphone, I think we addressed the bedroom situation last month. I didn't catch it. Uh, I think it was one more. The current bedrooms in the, the small. Plan. I think it's the same. I think it was four. It went from four to four, I believe. Well, there's a there's a. Is, I don't know the exact dimension, but there's like a 10 foot by 9 foot room that will be my so called because I spend every third week up here so my wife can go home, and that's just so I can work to keep the whole <laughs> to keep the whole operation going. So it's, it's a tiny little space. Yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about that. It doesn't have a doesn't have a closet in it, does it? Yeah, no. If it doesn't have a closet, yeah. technically it's not a my, my recollection from the last meeting is that the, the number of bedrooms didn't change from the two cottages to the one. I think it stayed, it was four with the two cottages, and I think it's four with the new building. I believe that's right. Okay. And the, bedroom, and the bathrooms, how, how much? It has three bedrooms plus his office. 
Okay. And what about the bathrooms? Uh, we got a master bath, a hallway bath upstairs. I show five bathrooms. Downstairs. Is that right? I show five on the new plan. Is that right? And I'm assuming there were two in the old plan. Am I wrong? Or? It sounds right, but I, I can't recall. I'm sorry. No, don't, right. so, don't confuse bathrooms with the laundry room. Uh, fair. Yeah, that, that could be a problem. Uh, good question. Um, here's here's that might, that might be, like to do That might be the five bathrooms, but don't forget there's two units, and two of those bathrooms are in the other unit. The main house has three three bathrooms. So here's where we're at. We've got the four criteria, and I'd like to come back to the board and discuss the four criteria if we could. And if we do that, um, Mr. Fisher, are you going to be the one that kind of walks through the, the criteria with us? Sure. <clears throat> I just want to make sure I get the right date here. There's three bathrooms and one in the end. So for the record, I guess there's three baths. This was four bathrooms and a utility closet for laundry. Laundry, is that right? Okay. So if we start with, sorry, I had it here a second ago. Uh, the uh, landing question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return. Applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. That is the, the first criteria in the law regarding that. So why don't we go ahead and answer that, Mr. Fisher. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'll give you my answer for the uh, um, regulation here in just a moment, but um, I know the board has, uh, and not just the board in this community, but in others as well, tend to struggle with a lot of this criteria, and particularly the first one. It's very subjective as just to what reasonable return is, and it's you ask any given people, and you'll probably eight people, and you'll probably get eight different, slightly different answers. In fact, I would say the best answer I've ever heard is from our our uh, code enforcement officer. It lasts two meetings ago. I think you defined it the best I've ever seen. I wasn't even asking for a variance. <laughs> you just need to find it, though. <laughs> but go ahead. You can come up here, though, and you can do it from this side. Um, I, I've also, uh, I wouldn't say I've struggled with it, but um, I've, I've paid a lot more attention to this even more recently than, than I used to as far as reasonable return is concerned. And I guess the argument that I would make, not just in this particular situation, but in any given situation, is you know, what is that subjective term of reasonable? I know that uh, somebody uh, officially at some point up in wherever it was in the state uh, said, well, you could have you know, two Adirondack chairs or a hammock hanging between some trees and that's a return to your lot. And they're right. If you've got a lot that's completely vacant and surrounded by other lots that are completely vacant and there's no other changes, then that's pretty reasonable. If you've got a lot, however, that's in a community like Higgins Beach, and let's call it what it is, it is, it is relatively speaking its own little community. It's fairly densely packed. It's almost an urban as opposed to a suburban environment given the way everything is, is laid out there. So what does reasonable return become? Is it reasonable, can you use your lot anyway? Or is it, can you use your lot the way other people are using their lots in that similar situation? Not necessarily the absolute size, but is there a house that is going to be there now and is going to be replaced with another house? It's not a duplex, it's a two-family house, but the second portion of that is an ADU. It's not a duplex or a townhouse. So as far as reasonable return is concerned, it would be, to me, what is reasonable for the area in which we're located. And if somebody would like to be able to purchase a lot such as this one that has two houses on it right now, a reasonable return to them, in fact, this is literally the case, would be they'd like to be able to put two units on it. Now, two separate houses, two units in one house. And one house at the criteria without the expense of beating this dead horse it's still only a two-story house. We can't put it on the ground. We could make a roof pitch a lot higher than it is, but we don't want to. Um, it could possibly, I can't, I'm not going to speak for the architect, but it possibly could be even lowered a little bit more, but still have to be functional somehow. We've got, those of us who have full basements have probably chock full of stuff down there. We can't do that in this case. We have to put it somewhere so it goes in the attic, like most of us also have. So i just like to be able to kind of get beyond that, uh, that issue of, of overall height saying, it's really still a two-story house. It's long, but it's still only two stories. Specifically to answer the question, 
Uh, as far as reasonable return is concerned, the current lot supports two separate units that could not be sold separately and tried for almost three years. The previous owners thus accepted the advice of the Zoning Board of Appeals earlier this year and sold that lot to the current owner as a property that would be uh, or support a single structure uh, with that ADU. Without a variance to support a single structure, the lot could not be sold. Uh, it had a uh, um, it did support a, a, uh, had been marketed for three years with no potential buyers. Uh, because of that very small building envelope, and there's a tiny envelope as there are in most of the lots there, uh, a, um, a single structure could not be built on the lot and no reasonable return could be that be expected. Reasonable return, quote unquote, in this case, would be any home in the neighborhood that is in keeping with other homes in the overall area, thereby making the economic return for anyone who owns a house in the vicinity of the locus similar to what anyone else in the neighborhood could reasonably be expected to achieve in their value. Thank you. Thank you. Next one. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property. The criterion applies to property, not people, and to uncommon conditions not shared by the neighborhood. In many cases, this is one of the easier ones to operate because they're almost all, or, or to answer because it's almost always uh, somewhat similar. The lot is legal, non-conforming, and is exceptionally small, as are most of them in that area. Created well before zoning was even enacted, the small lot requires a variance for any viable house to be constructed on it. The unique circumstance, therefore, are the small lot, uh, or small size of the lot uh, and the building envelope and the creation of that lot prior to any zoning restrictions in the area. Okay, and the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, the essential character characteristics of the neighborhood, such as density, development, large open space, or rural. Thank you for doing this so well, by the way. Another one that it often is not too big of a deal, but is in this case, uh, let's face it and call it what it is, the house is bigger, to be sure, considerably larger. But does it actually alter the overall character of that neighborhood? Not necessarily the house next door. With all due respect to McGoldrick, they've lived there for probably quite a long time. Certainly respect that. There's a lot of owners at Higgins Beach that live in considerably smaller homes than theirs. Uh, but what is that overall character of the neighborhood in terms of what are we becoming? It's not going to be any skyscrapers down there. We've got the height restrictions. We can't go beyond that even if anybody wanted to. You couldn't yet. I don't believe the board is even empowered to do that. So you're never going to see a higher house or a higher structure than 35 feet, notwithstanding chimneys. So that maintains an essential character throughout the entire, notwithstanding what's grandfathered there, and there are considerable number of houses that are a lot higher than that, but they're older. Uh, so the character is still more contemporary now even with a house like this than it was decades and, and scores of years ago. So that character is really, what is Higgins Beach now? What is it becoming? I can tell you with all the work that we've done over the past more than two decades, it's becoming a community of people, more and more people who are living there year round. When we first came to the area and we started this company, uh, and a lot longer before then, much of Higgins Beach and some of Pine Point were basically cottages, summer cottages. Many of them are very poorly constructed and they're only constructed as seasonal cottages. Nobody's doing that anymore. People are building houses that they intend to live in, in many cases, as their principal structure. It's close to Portland, Portland's growing, Scarborough's growing, et cetera, et cetera. So when you get into character of neighborhood, I think it's more of a, where's the neighborhood going? And do we want to lag it behind or lag behind that, or do we want to keep up with that? So the, uh, the variance uh, will enhance that uh, uh, neighborhood character by replacing the two existing detached buildings with one structure bringing the lot into greater conformity with the area than what is there currently, which is two houses on one lot. The proposed two-story house fits well within the, uh, the similar two- and three-story structures that are in the immediate vicinity of the locus. And again, absolutely all due respect to Mr. McGoldrick, he's lived there, well, I don't live there, I've spent a lot of time there, but he's lived there a long time. Uh, I presume he showed you the photographs of the distances from the back. We've also showed you the photographs from the, photographs from the front. This would be a tall house, but Again, every other lot in that block on both sides of the street, with one exception, is at least two stories high. Now, our two stories are a little bit higher, but some of that we, we can't, we, we'd lower it by five feet if we could, but we can't, it's federal law. And the next one is the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner of the property. Can I get back to the last question a minute? Yes, sure, go ahead. I'd like to read something here on your application for the variance and then where it says uh, all, not all to the essential character they give a definition on your application of essential character it's the character the characteristics of the neighborhood such as densely developed 
open space or rural. An example, a front yard setback reduction in a densely developed neighborhood but most other properties are already close to the street would not alter the character. In other words, character deals with dimensional standards, not aesthetics. That's on your application form. It's not on our current application. Well, that's what the definition was. Mm, yeah, it's not on the current application. The hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner of the property. Uh, another relatively simple one in this case. The hardship is the result of zoning that was enacted long after the lot was created, thereby restricting any new construction to an extremely small building envelope. It is wholly impractical for any residential structure. Anybody wanting to do anything on any lot is very, under the current regulations, it's likely going to be, unless it's a double lot, is likely going to be coming before the board. And much of my time before the board has been spent in that similar vein. Very good. So those are four criteria. Um, let me bring it back to the board for discussion either amongst ourselves or with uh, the applicant or his uh, advisors. And uh, anybody wish to start? Uh, I'll start. I, um, I'm really torn on this one, and it's probably going to be a game time decision for me because I do think that that third floor on there changes the, the character of it a, a lot. Um, it, 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 with, the, with that additional storage space on the third floor, it makes you raise that roof. Just that extra amount that it makes the whole structure look even larger than it is. It is a large structure, but that just makes it look that much larger. And I, I think, to me, if it was down a little bit lower, I, I think that that would, for me, uh, even though I think it would still change the essential character of the day. And, and when I talk about essential character, I'm not talking dimensions. When, you, when we went through the, and sat through the, the state-run classes on this, it, it, it was not just dimensional what they were talking about. It's the character, the physical character, and everything of that neighborhood. So I, I take all the other homes into account as well. So like I say, I think if it came down, I, I would probably be able to work with it. And I still may, but it's going to be a game time decision. I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. And that's on number three that you were talking about? Yes. Sir. Other uh, comments from board members, discussions, questions? Statements? I'm still struggling with reasonable return. Um, I've heard the arguments. I understand what you're saying. I don't think you've swayed my decision. I still think, again, there are things that can be done around changing that building that it doesn't have to be done this way. And if you go back to the question where it states, <coughs> No one will buy unless this proposed construction can occur. I think there are other options. It needs to be changed because I think that 65-foot dimension is just way too much with the elevation of the roof line. I think it's, a, it's just too much mass. Okay. And, and I think it needs to be addressed. Are there any comments on the, any of the issues? Um, I'm, I'm still <coughs> struggling with reasonable return and essential character and locality. Struggling with both of them. I, I mean, we asked you folks to come back with something a little bit different to bring back before us so that we could look at it and hopefully it would meet the criteria a little bit better and it'd be something we could feel justifiable in answering yes to those questions. Um, Mr. Fishy, I think you gave us one foot, two foot, and, and two foot. Two foot. I don't know if that really meets what we were looking for. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it coming. I think it's still too big. Other comments, questions? It's open forum, so feel free. Uh, one comment I have is that uh, looking at the question one, if not all virtual uh, reasonable use is gone, uh, if we do not uh, approve this particular plan here, there are, like I said, um, there are other things that can be done, like decreasing the bedroom or removing the attic space. That seems to be a popular point of discussion tonight. Um, it does. I mean, the attic space does look significant. Would looks like a closet off of the storage room. That's all I have. Here's some of my concerns, Mr. Fisher. Um, we've spent a lot of time on on uh, variance due to the unique circumstances of the property. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, landing question cannot yield a feasible return. And you've done a heck of a good job over the years of documenting why a building isn't even structurally safe. We've set a pretty high standard in the past. If we're going to go back to standards and going back to the past, 
Um, again, that's the dangerous part about asking for precedent, is precedent is set as far as what we've defined about a house that is not um, viable. And it's not just because of the two properties. Uh, no comment is even made about whether these buildings are structurally sound or not. They may not be. They may be, but I haven't heard that argument. And in the past, every ordinance, and, and let's go back to that house that we're talking about, the big house. I was on the I was the chair of the, of the uh, zoning board at that time, and that was a vacant lot at the end of a street with a very contentious uh, battle. And um, uh, I'm sorry, what what what's the property that uh, earlier uh, Mr. Wilson had commented about that was trying to use as an example of what we've done in the past? Okay, now that had a house on it. That no, that's not the one we're talking it's about. On Ocean Avenue, past the stop sign, the last third one, house on the left. What I'm thinking about, it doesn't matter. It just comes back to, again, the, the risks of starting to go back and look at, number one, there are no precedents. Number two, if you want to go that path, it's usually, when I kill my kids, is you never want to go that path because there's two sides of that path. It's always ugly. And the ugliest one I see here is this property's fine as it sits. I don't see it not being usable. I don't blame them for wanting to change it. A matter of fact, I would feel confident in looking at something. I would actually be able to rationalize, and it would be rationalizing, the justification for reasonable return um, on that, uh, given the fact that we've bludgeoned numerous people over the years with, you know, I want to see the how many insects are in the wood. I mean, we've gotten that defined where you've had to really fight for your people. We haven't talked about that. So that's the first one. The second one is, the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property. I think it's fair. I agree. I mean, that's that's fair. And that's why I could actually rationalize, number one, actually. And number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. Um, that's an opinion. That's always been an opinion. And characters, are, as a matter of fact, I looked it up in the definitions for Scarborough, and we don't even have a definition for it, um, which is interesting. So it's not even in the in the book. I've seen people pull a dictionary out on me before. Please don't do that. Um, but the fact is that there's, I can understand both Mr. Wilson's position and some of the board members' positions on that. And I don't know, I, I've said it before, I do not know a better designer than, than uh, Mr. Wilson. I think there are a lot of good ones out there that certainly gives a, a flair for uh, th that type of home, and I love it, style home. The hardship is not a result of the action of the applicant or prior owners. Um, Again, uh, this bothers me a little bit, um, Mr. Dayton, because I, I don't know whether or not you were told the whole facts when you bought your property. Um, a variance is not a given. It never was a given and never is a given. As a matter of fact, the proof of that is that the people that came to get the variance sold the property because they couldn't get what they wanted. So by definition, this wasn't a gimme. So I... I I am concerned for you for that. It bothers me. It really does. And, and what other ramifications about that, I don't know. But the applicant, in fact, bought the property in May. <clears throat> if he was told, oh, no big deal, you can go do this, you were wronged. I'm just going to call it straight up. You were wronged if you were told that. Um, be it by somebody in the town or somebody, anybody else, you were wronged because nothing's a gimme. And, and uh, so, when I look at all four of these things, here's, I wasn't at the last meeting, and, and to be honest with you, it was, seemed fairly contentious and I don't like that. Um, but this is what I expected from the last meeting, from what I heard from everybody here saying. I expected two floors with the same design on the two floors, maybe a little bit smaller than the version that you have right here. And I would put money on the fact that would have passed. But that's not what's here. What's here is, and, and I get the fact that we're talking stories, but I think we're talking floors. And I think that the same design dropped 12 feet, still getting, I mean, I'm picking a number on my butt, but I mean, you guys know what I'm, I mean by that. By dropping that down and doing the exact, it's going to narrow down the bedrooms, obviously, because you're going to have the four-foot sets, insets, I get that or whatever it's going to be, they'd be able to make it happen. But you can throw dormers on it, as you pointed out, Mr. Wilson. I personally think this this is a stretch, um, and it doesn't necessarily fit what I believe is um, 
about an essential character. I, I, I see a lot of flaws. And, and I like to say, I wasn't here at the last meeting, but, but I see a lot of flaws, and I see this going the wrong way. Um, if I were here at that meeting, I would have said, come back with two floors. That's what I, I would have said straight up. Come back with two floors. We did um, come back with two You've got three floors, and we're not going to debate it. We have three floors. floors. And we've got an attic. Please don't debate it. We've got three floors. That's how I look at it. And I don't, to me, a floor is a floor. Matter of fact, you could finish off that attic and still have a bedroom in the bathroom up there if you wanted to. We put a flat roof on the whole thing. Yeah. That's right. So, change of character. so what I'm getting at is we can continue down this path. I don't have any problem with that. Um, I do not think coming back with a two-floor version of this would override. I don't believe that would meet the standard of waiting one year before you come back for some things that didn't change. So that's a heads up. I'm, I'm just reading people here, and I'm going, that's a heads up. I, I think we really have to go back to exactly what everybody's talking about. Let's talk about that reasonable return piece, because that's a battle. Let's talk about that, because we have, we, that got a pass for you guys. It got a pass. Good for you. <laughs> but it got a pass. Let's talk about the essential character and how much different, I believe, you'd see in a cape style design as opposed to a, in essence, a colonial style design. I know it's not, but the, the two walls versus the, the wall with the, the ease uh, with the uh, dormers. Um, I, I think a fair question that needs to be answered is, you know, was the applicant lied to? I mean, if he was, I think that's a legitimate reason for, for uh, the hardship. I don't think that's fair. I mean, it does, obviously he's an intelligent man, but I, you know, I hope he would have done some homework. But I won't hold that against. I don't believe in holding something like that against somebody. I don't think that's fair. Um, but I think realistically, there's some there. The challenge I see based on what I'm hearing is that this is going to fail, and you're going to be stuck sitting around for a year. And I don't think anybody wants that, including this board. I agree with that statement. Yeah, and I would echo the chair's comments that Mr. Fisher and past when we've we've asked you to come back to us with more pertinent information, structural integrity, um, ADA compliance, anything like that. We've done an exceptional job with that. And really on this one we haven't really heard anything like that about either one of the two structures that's up there now. I mean I know we're demolishing them so it's really kind of a moot point. But it would be nice to kind of have some of that information as to why you may need this space because of things like that, maybe ADA compliant or something, if you do have a child with a disability or, or whatever, maybe more pertinent to that, that may be something that you've done a wonderful job in the past with, giving us that information when we've asked for that. I mean, granted, these structures are going to be torn down, so there's really no reason to belabor the fact as to whether or not they're structurally sound or not. And Ms. Dayton, I've got to tell you, you've got two of the best people I know out there. There are others that are also good, but you've got two of the, certainly, the, the, they're in the top of, the, of their fields. Uh, my advice uh, is you don't want to vote. But that's your call. Well, I've heard that from about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and may I, may I add to uh, what the chair said as well? Mr. Wilson is one of the best designers, and if I were ever doing a modification in my house, he would be the person I would call first. So this is not about abilities. Both of these gentlemen are very capable and very good at what they do. This is about just a discrepancy or a difference in opinion. So I appreciate the work that they do, and I'm glad that they keep coming back to the board because they do represent the people of Scarborough very well. Um, then how would you like to proceed? Um, I, I, you I'm not sure, Brian. I don't know if this is a point of order or not, but uh, can we table one more time? And rather than get a no vote, it, well, it's I'll just useless. We can, come back, we can table it for a reason. So um, I need some clarification on... Um, the number one. I don't think uh, we've met number one, and I wish that we uh, table it uh, for that reason, uh, with other notes being noted, other com other points being noted. So I'll, I'll move to table that. Um, the table doesn't get uh, discussion. All in favor? That's unanimous. Are you un uh, opposed? Uh, no, I'm not voting. Yeah, 
Okay. You can still vote. I still just didn't have you. Don't, it's okay. So, okay. So, yeah. so it's unanimous. Okay. Just so you know, no, but that was just there. We, we, anytime we have more than five members, we have uh, they're active in the process. Mm -hmm. To not allow them to be able to raise a hand or, or take an opinion, to me, is a violation of the work they come in here to do, that they spend their time in, and it discounts their value. I, I, that's why I've always said to any, uh, whenever we have more than five, because it's five or it's two alternates, we always make sure the alternates are voting, because that point, their opinion matters, even though it doesn't matter in the scorecard. And, and Mr. Maroon, may I ask a question before they take off? Yes. Even though we have, we've closed it, do, do you have to open it again? No. no, no. All right. Um, By the way, I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, my question is to actually all three, uh, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Fisher, and Mr. Dayton, have we given them enough information to walk away knowing, have we told you enough that you walk away with information that you can do something with? From a design standpoint, probably. Well, I'm having a hard time saying we got a two-story house with a roof on it, and I don't understand how it's a three-story house other than it's got an attic for mechanics up there. And I don't know how you're going to do a two-story house without a roof and an attic. So that I guess I, I kind of picked up on that confusion or discrepancy. I'll try and re-clarify. I'm not speaking for the board. No. Uh, I'm just speaking for me. But what I expected after seeing that meeting was that you'd see a cave. They don't have attics. What doesn't have attics? Well, I mean, if you, they, they might have a little crib, but typically a cave doesn't have an attic. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, if you would read the definition of story. Any enclosed... <laughs> well, you're really just sharp today. Any enclosed habitable area, floor area, other than a basement or cellar, which is separated by more than six feet vertical distance from any other enclosed habitable floor area in the same building. That's the argument for the three-story. Uh, I, I use a different definition to me. It's a floor if I can stand in it. I'm pretty short. Well, so one, of the, one of the reasons we need an attic, <laughs> like, like Jim was saying, we need to put the air conditioning I units and the heat system and all that. We need to move on from here, but, and, I'm, and I don't want to be rude, but at the same thing, we got a long meeting and it's okay. already... Uh, sorry, I asked the question. Uh, um, you feel free to go back and speak with, with uh, Mr. Longstaff. He, d he definitely knows where our, my head is. I, I know that. Yeah, and I hope this, this time just take that into consideration what we're really, really hoping for. And again, I'm sorry, it's uh, not the answer we wanted. Okay. So the next agenda item is uh, 2556, a special exception of request by um, Marnie uh, with that, with this 14 Barley Lane, Assessor's Map, R20, Parcel 117. Good evening. I'm Marnie Wiedis. Nice to meet you. Was that your son that was here with us earlier? Yes. <laughs> Might be asleep in the hallway. Nice looking kid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He is. If you'd like to just uh, explain what you'd like to do, and we'll go through. Yes. Um, I am looking to start uh, a plant service business based out of my home. Um, it is, uh, I brought some ideas. Mr. Longstaff uh, thought it might make sense for me to bring in some of the ideas that I have, some of the products that I have. Looks like can grab some of that afterwards, um, <laughs> but I missed it. What did it you say? It looks like cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a money plant. Everyone needs a money plant in their place of establishment. Um, but it is a plant service business where I go in and um, provide fresh, uh, vibrant plants in um, whether it's a residential or a commercial space and go in on a monthly or every two-week basis to freshen, clean, um, so that the person has the benefit of the nature and the benefit of extra oxygen in their space. Okay, very good, thank you. This is a, um, as pointed out, this is a special exception. This is, yes it is. The special exceptions are on page. It's on page uh, 2 6. Oh, 2 6. I'm sorry, that's miscellaneous, which we'll come back to anyway. 4 6. 3 6, I'm sorry. 
Okay. So, um, what I'd like to do is go right through. Um, do we have any letters or, or phone calls? In this? We do. One. Uh, one letter. <coughs> I'll read it in. Uh, this is from uh, Karen Patterson. Nope. Nope, that's you. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Tom and Linda Sheehan. 16 Barley Lane. What are you? Uh, Ms. Longstaff, we received a mail, a letter from you informing us that our neighbor, Marnie Widas, is my parents saying it properly? Widas. Widas, sorry. Widas? Widas, yes. Widas, sorry. Uh, 14 Barley Lane is applying for a special exception permit for her, own, her new home occupation business as living arts supplier. We are neighbors at 16 Barley Lane. We totally support Marnie in her, in her endeavor. We have no issue and we both wish her all the best. She's a great neighbor who may be supporting money with a new business, Tom and Linda Sheehan, 16 Barley Lane, uh, Scarborough. So uh, why don't we jump right into the criteria on special exception, if everybody's okay with that, and we'll have you read it in. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. If you'd just like to read in what you wrote, sure. that'd be great, okay? Um, the house plants are transplanted into non-toxic substrate or gel, so it's a polymer gel or a pond substrate that it's actually planted into. So it actually, most of the plants are out of the soil itself um, and any of the somewhat harmful fertilizer that might be used. Um, so for the purpose of eliminating emissions for improved air quality and water quality. Okay. Um, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, the, the traffic should not be changed at all in the development. Um, on occasion, I might have something that's purchased online and I might have a delivery, but the UPS or FedEx is in the neighborhood already um, on a daily basis. So nobody comes to the house for servicing. I bring the product to um, the place to be serviced. So there's no additional traffic. And you know, you, do you have a special van or anything that you use? Or? Just my uh, SUV type vehicle. Yeah. The proposed use will not create uh, public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood? Um, the plant material or the soil uh, can be composted uh, on the property, uh, plastic containers recycled, although I reuse a lot of them. Um, no product used um, is an accelerant for fire hazard, um, so in the sense of um, uh, emergency services needing to come in or anything like that, that's a non-issue. Um, no cash is on the property to encourage theft or any anything along that line. Okay. The proposed use not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies? Uh, once again, it's a non-toxic product. I'm just adding water to it and a non-toxic fertilizer to the product. Um, anything that would go down into um, our um, Home um, septic. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything to jeopardize that to begin with. So um, uh, I used unused um, natural compost will be returned back to the earth. Um, reusing in um, the bucket. Wait a minute. I lost my train of thought. Don't Hang on that. one second. Uh, so the product is non-toxic. Um, I any unused natural compost will be returned to the earth. Um, or placed into a reuse bucket for further plantings. So a lot of the product that I do take, whether it's the soil or when I'm restructuring plants, I would reuse that product back into another planting. The proposed use will be compatible with these issues in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Um, so this question was a little confusing to me, so I wasn't sure if it was the product or where I'm actually Basically, performing the cert, like the, the work that I'm doing. I wanted to make sure I understood that. It's, uh, <laughs> it could be either. Yeah, okay. I answered it okay. So the, I'm designing the product in my kitchen right now, um, so that space, so I'm not adding space, and I have a one season um, uh, screen, uh, closed-in porch in the back that at one point might be finished off 
so that I could use that space as, as the um, direction, the plant area. Thank you, Drew. Um, and the product itself, if that's what we're talking about, um, the product is, most of it's in my home. Um, right now I'm very flush with product because I'm waiting for your acceptance for me to be a business so that I can take what's already um, designed in the house and, and bring it to, to account. And you're not in the Shoreline Zone. I am not, no. Are the applicant sufficient right title or interest in the, in the site? Uh, you get a copy of the deed here, so that's fine. The applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards <coughs> section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. It's the stupidest question you could ask, but go ahead. I'll let you answer it. Um, I've been using this type of... Um, <laughs> replanting or um, house plant use for years and I'm just sorting trying to do this in, a, in the sense of a business so I've already been doing it for my personal use I know how to do it I'm very good at it <laughs> and I love bringing nature out to people so um, I think that I have what H is asking for okay the uh, proposed use will be compatible with existing use neighbors with respect to generation and of noise and hours of operation uh, normal residential noise. Uh, maybe they'll hear me more if the TV or radio is on because I won't be out working um, outside the home. Um, but there would not be a additional noise or a nuisance for the neighbors. And then why don't we go right into the, you did a great job of putting this together, the home occupation requirements. Uh, the uh, occupation of profession shall be carried out wholly within the principal resident uh, dwelling and, uh, or, without, or within the building accessory there too. So basically, you're going to be doing it in the garage or in your in your your porch, but not outside of that. Correct. Uh, the home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Uh, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the occupation. Correct. I am the sole provider. Yep. And exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with home occupation sign uh, provisions. Do you need a sign? Or? No, I do not. And um, there shall be no, is there any reason in the future that you might want a sign? Not at my house, no. Um, is it, well, we'll, what if I had something on my vehicle? That's fine. That's okay. That's fine. And it parked in my driveway? You can do that. Okay. There shall be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials, no other exterior indication of the home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal dwelling, I uh, accept this provided. And you can just answer your question. Oh, uh, I'm creating, number five, number five uh, I'm creating the decor from household plants. Um, these will be interior plants. Um, uh, they're my own personal creations. Um, these are displays um, of art in which on occasion will be displayed outdoors on my porch. <coughs> With larger larger plant items like ferns or those kinds of things that just traditional um, floor plants that might be out on the porch, but other than that, I do that anyway. <laughs> and uh, no nuisance shall be generated, including not uh, necessarily limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, Correct. vehicle air. Correct. Number six. No. And traffic uh, generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. Correct, just the occasional UPS delivery. In addition to the off-site parking uh, provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, adequate off-street off parking shall be provided. That's not applicable. Correct. Um, and then the home occupation may utilize, uh, you're using less than 20% of your dwelling. Um, is that yes. basically the theory is you're gonna be just doing most yes. of it? Yes, correct. Um, See, basically that doesn't apply. So good. Why don't I open it up to the public? If anybody would like from the public to speak on this, in the public hearing. Sure, you want to say anything, bud? Sure, you want to say anything? Oh. <laughs> well, is the public hearing too late? Um, <laughs> <laughs> any? Um, I come to the board for questions. No, no other letters in the chat.
Uh, board for question, comments, or a motion? When you said that you were going to be displaying things on your porch, it should be no more than the normal homeowner would have out there, right? Correct. And did I understand you that uh, there's a gel media that you put the plants into? Uh, what bulk storage would you have for that gel before it goes into the product? What size volume? The gel are like little pebbles. Um, they're dehydrated. Would you have a 55-gallon drum of this stuff? No, or, no, 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 no. That, that's what I'm talking about. What kind of a volume would you have in preparation to do your work? Um, I usually have literally a quart, like a Ziploc quart bag okay. of it. The pond substrate are larger bags, and I usually have two of those that are probably like a five-gallon, uh, like a five-pound um, bag, like a large flower bag. Okay, thank you. And could that, you, you know... Could you pond substrate? Sure. Would you like to feel it? No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it looks like thick cat litter is the best way I can describe it. So, or like in a fish tank, that kind of product that um, the rocks that are on the bottom of... Thank you. You're welcome. Um, other questions, comments, or a motion? I think, he's, uh, I think you've done a very nice job on that, and uh, it's a nice little home occupation. Thank you. Use. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Uh, motion to, uh, to approve appeal number 2556 as presented. Second. And seconded by. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? To be pretty straightforward. Good luck with it. Yes. Uh, all in favor? That's uh, unanimous. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you Thank very, very much. I appreciate it. Next appeal is appeal number 2557. It's a limited reduction of the yard size by Stephen and Barbara Price, 3 Ramsey Terrace, Assessor's Map, U6, Parcel 18. Mr. Price, good seeing you again. Hi, Mark. Okay, Ms. Price, would you like to explain what you're trying to accomplish? State your name and address, and we'll go from there. Well, Steve Price, through Ramsey Terrace in Scarborough. Uh, <clears throat> I propose uh, building a small 15 by 24 single bay garage on a slab, um, appealing for a 10 foot setback from the 15 foot setback just so that I can keep a reasonable space between my existing structure, the deck, and the pool. Um, and still get a reasonably sized garage in there. And this is a limited reduction of yard size. It's page three, section uh, V. I'm sorry, V three six. Um, okay. So, um, Mr. Longstaff, anything to add on this one? Any issues that you'd like to? You said your comments. Uh, no, my comments. I think pretty much, pretty much sum it up. Um, it appears to be the right. Uh, vehicle for this kind of request. Um, the house does meet the, the uh, conditions of uh, the appropriate age uh, of the structure. Um, the setback request is no more than 10 feet. So I think, uh, I think he's and that's including the use. In, in the use. Good. Okay. Yep. Uh, why don't we go through the requirements of the order? So I'll just read in the, uh, the question and you can just respond, okay? The existing buildings are structures on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size uh, is requested were erected prior to July 3rd, 1991 
while the lot is a vacant, non-conforming lot of record. Existing buildings on the property were constructed prior to July 3rd, 1991. I believe the exact date that the property appeared on tax rolls was 1959. Okay. I think I wrote that in on, on yes, everybody else's packet. I don't have it on mine now. <laughs> the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or the occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Many of the other properties in our immediate neighborhood have garages, and this addition to our property would allow us to continue to use the property in the same manner as those around us. In fact, I took down a 10 foot by 12 foot shed um, that was on its last legs, and this is going to replace that. So. Okay. And due to the physical features of the lot and or the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion and enlargement of a new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard, si uh, yard size requirements. Right, as I said before, um, the location of our home and deck and wanting to keep kind of a, an open area of about eight feet between those and the garage, I could move the garage closer and not even have to come before the board, <clears throat> but I want to maintain that space uh, for walkway and travel and stuff. Uh, due to the existing features of the lot and the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion and enlargement of the new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. Uh, the impact and effects of this new building will not be substantially different from the impacts it would have on the neighborhood if it were built within the current yard size requirement. In fact, the proposed 10 foot setback would still be greater than many of the homes and garages in the neighborhood. I think I think I do me a favor, do read number three for me. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. The location of our home deck and pool on the property make it desirable to build this new structure with some open space between these existing structures and the proposed garage. Okay. Am I on the right? Yes. Yeah, and then you just answered the other one, which is the impacts and effects of the enlargement expansion of new building or structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. Right. You don't have to repeat it. That's my number four. And the applicant has not commenced construction or enlargement expansion building structure of this up for which limited reaction in yard size is requested. So the board is not looking at an after the fact application. Correct. Very good. Thank you. And um, any letters on this? Yes. Open the public hearing on this. Anybody from the public wish to speak? And now I'll close the public hearing part of this and come back to the board. Um, I'll just jump in real quick if the board doesn't mind. Uh, most people really actually want them attached, and I think it's interesting that you choose not to, and I kind of like that. Um, I mean, but the argument could be made if somebody felt like it that um, there we go. Uh, due to the physical features of the lot or location of existing structures on the lot, it not, would not be practical to construct. The proposed expansion enlargement new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. I mean, we're all used to seeing houses that are attached with garages, and the old school is that they weren't attached. So I'm okay with that because of that. I think it's kind of refreshing to see um, a little bit of, again, it's design flavor and, and different tastes. So even though that doesn't nail it, I have no concern with that. But I do want to bring it up because it is, it is a little different than what we usually see. Uh, other board member comments, questions? To, to go into what you're adding, oh, no, please. I didn't see you. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, are you going to run power to this new garage? Yes. Great. I'm just curious. To add to what the chairman was saying, uh, I grew up with the unattached garage at my home, so it's a comfortable situation for me. But I think in this particular case, since the applicant isn't asking for something ridiculous or you know, something out of the ordinary that it fits. So I think it's applicable here, and, and argument three can be agreed to. Okay. Board members, any comments, questions? Or do I have a motion? I move to approve uh, appeal number 2558 uh, as presented. Second. Second. Uh, second? 50, 57, second. I'm sorry, 57. 57, just a correction of that. Oh, second, 57, too. Okay. Good. All right, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Oh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you very much. It's good seeing you again. <laughs> sure. Um,
The time is 9 o'clock. We're going to take a five-minute recess. We'll re-adjourn well, we'll re it at, at uh, 10 after. So we're going to adjourn for seven minutes.
didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I'm going to open the meeting, but I'm going to wait a minute for Mr. Crockett to return. Um, can you just go check where you sure. So the meeting is open. I apologize for that, but I uh, just want to make sure that uh, we have everybody here. We're going to start the meeting. Uh, Mr. Crockett has to step out for a minute. I'm sure he'll be back. He will be uh, obviously not missing too much for, as we start here. So uh, if you'd like to take the microphone, is, is this Ms. Bar Ms. Barber? Uh, I'm Catherine Joyner. Catherine. I'm, I made the application I'm here on behalf of Julie Barber. Okay. I'm a certified building designer and a member of the American Institute of Building Design. Uh, Julie Barber of One Cliff Street is with us, and also uh, Craig Cooper of Rainbow Construction, who is a contractor for the project. So if you have any questions for them, they're available. Our proposal is to add an attached garage to an existing home. In order to do that, we would remove the existing one-car garage that's off to the side. Um, we're actually improving the setback issues with that existing garage, which is two feet from the property line. The new garage would be 10 feet to the roof overhang, so 11 feet to the building itself. So that's a significant improvement. The front of the existing garage is 20 feet from the Houghton Street property line. Our new garage would maintain that distance of 20 feet, so we're not increasing that at all. And then we're modifying the paved area slightly in order to keep the lot coverage uh, numbers exactly the same. If we need to, we will take some of the patio space off the back patio in order to keep those numbers exactly as they are and not increase that. Okay. Um, the existing garage is at an angle to the house and structurally it would need a tremendous amount of repair in order to use it. And so we felt building new was a better solution for what we were trying to do here. And it, like, as I said before, it does actually improve the lot conditions. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what it is. We're, we're, getting, we're asking for the reduction of the side yard setbacks, side yard from 15 to 10, uh, front yard from 30 to 20, and containing that new attached garage. Uh, so it will now be attached to the house, in line with the house, architecturally similar to the existing home. And there's a, we're modifying the entryway slightly and adding a porch on the front just to have some coverage as you enter the home. Mm -hmm. So uh, are there any questions based on the package? I'm sure there will be. Uh, give us one second here to just kind of uh, get us thoughts together. Uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Crockett, I'm, I apologize for starting without you. I didn't realize, I didn't that's see you fine. past, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's my fault for starting ahead of time. Not a problem. <coughs> I apologize. Oh, you didn't have to. I'm the one that did it. All right, so just to make sure I get this right, you're basically taking one garage out yes. and you're bringing, it, you're coming into more conformance. Yes. with the building. Right. And um, square footage wise, you're increasing how much more of the building space? I mean, the, the unit itself, is it just? Well, the only increase in square footage is um, the entryway. And I probably have that, don't I have that written down on that? Uh, you probably do, I just can't see it. And, I, and it's also a little bit helpful for. Yep, um, there's a, no, that's not it. Well, it's, let's see, let's look at the second floor plan. I don't have a square footage on there. 
it's basically 24 by 28. We're adding a, you know, a, some space over the garage for storage and an office slash studio space. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that is they do have an existing basement, but there are some moisture issues with it, so this gives them the ability to have some, some good dry storage off their second floor, which is accessed you know, through a bedroom, so it's really private space. Okay, it's so on the site, uh, on the plot plan. Existing finished living space is 2529, and proposed finished living space is 3287. Okay, now that's, I was actually thinking more about footprint. Um, what, how much is your footprint increasing by? How much is my footprint of finished space? Of just, of the, when you take the old garage away. Yep, the old garage is 16 by 20, and the new garage is 24 by 28, basically. There's a corner, a corner taken out of it where it attaches to the house. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, I see 24 okay, by 28 and by 18. Okay. Right. Okay. And the lot coverage calculations, there is um, a detailed report on that same page. the square footage. Got it up on the screen. Great. Oh, good. Thank you. That was nice that you gave that thorough information. Uh, Mr. Long step, any comments, questions that you want to bring up at this point in time? Uh, n none really other than my staff comments. Um, just to recap, um, this does appear to be the correct vehicle. The requests for the relief on the setbacks are within the parameters of the limited reduction of yard size. Uh, the structure is of the appropriate age. It meets that requirement as well. Um, and obviously, you need to go down through the criteria one through five to determine if um, yeah, all the other criteria are satisfied. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, one one other thing. It does appear that all of the development that sh she's proposing is not within the first 75 feet of the shoreline zone, so it's all out of the no-build area, which and she could out of the 30 percent expansion and all of that good stuff. Um, so it's now just a matter of keeping the same. Um, non-vegetated area on the lot that's currently Perfect. there. Okay, good, well, thank you. Um, but we do have some letters and phone calls. Oh, letters. Five letters. What I do is I'll open up the public hearing on this. Anybody wish to speak to this? I'd like to take uh, stand, state your name, and I'll read these in. But when you get ready, well, while you're getting set, I'll read these in. Um, this is uh, appeal number 2558, uh, Mr. Um, Rabbit, 14 Forest Street. I wish to voice my objection to this appeal. I live at 14 Forest Street, diagonally to the west northwest of the subject property. My main objection is a second story on the garage. As it is now, with the trees planted on the property at front boundary, we have a limited view of the beach out, of the, uh, out, of, out to the mouth of the Spermic River and over to Cape Elizabeth. In the winter, the trees are bare, and we have some view. This proposed renovation, especially the room above the garage, would permanently eliminate any views. It effectively creates a wall. I realize that the proposed renovation swaps old, uh, old lot coverage for new lot coverage, but it drastically increases volume and restrictions, restrictions with the second story. That was Jane Rabbit. The next one is um, John and Susan Osborne, and, and they're at 8 Houghton Street. Yes, so thorough. Thank you. Uh, we own the property behind one Cliff Street on Higgins Beach. We have no issue with making the current one car garage into a two-car garage. We do, however, have strong opposition to the construction of a second story above the proposed new garages. The garages are very uh, near our property line with our kitchen and dining room facing the structure. It appears that the new addition above the garages could be used as a secondary living space, requiring water, electricity, and sewer facilities. This makes us nervous as it could be also be used as an additional apartment to rent out. And it also gives us concern as it uh, is right on top of the, our side yard, taking additional airspace. Uh, we are against the proposed addition above uh, the proposed garages. Please enter our objection onto the record. The next one is um, Mary Best and Gordon Shapiro from 16 Forest Street. Uh, Mr. Longstaff, we own a home just north and west of uh, Cliff Street on Forest on Higgins Beach. Our pr house is diagonally built, uh, diagonally about one block from the subject residence. We would appreciate your consideration of our concerns and the referenced application. 
We do not object to the proposed change of making one car garage into a two car garage. We do, however, have strong opposition to the construction of a second story above the proposed new garage. The proposed garage would interfere with our view uh, of the ocean, limiting our view and negatively impact our enjoyment and use of the property. However, moreover, we have concern that the new addition above the garage, if supplied with utilities, could be utilized as a rentable apartment. If so, such a use would be inconsistent with the neighborhood and as we uh, understand it, would violate or be inconsistent with local codes or objectives. We are against the proposed addition above the proposed garage. Please enter our objection and record as heard. The next one is from uh, Catherine Mercer. I'm Mercier, I'm sorry, 14 Forest Street. I'd like to express my objection to the appeal regarding 1 Cliff Street. My home is 14 Forest Street, it's diagonally in back of Cliff Street property, a two car garage with a second story bonus from would further inhibit the limited view I currently have. The planned addition would be very large compared to the, with other garages in the Beach neighborhood. I am also concerned regarding compliance with setbacks and lot coverage in the shore zone and the precedent that could be set by granting this appeal. And then uh, the next one is Ray Robichaud, 53 Ocean Ave. Uh, I wish to object to the continued expansion of the property uh, that allow massive large homes that are too close together. This is one example of this. We are creating unsafe conditions both uh, for, uh, from a fire point, uh, standpoint and destroying the character of the beach uh, community. And then uh, that's it, no other phone calls. And if you could state your name and yeah. address. My, my name is David Lowry. I'm an attorney. I live in Cape Elizabeth, but I'm here tonight representing Diane Garofalo and Bob Westberg. Uh, who are immediate abutters of the property. I'd like to speak to the merits uh, later on when uh, after, you know, toward the end of the public comment. I don't want to take time to do that now. What I, what I wanted to do, there was a discussion a moment ago about you, a report. Mr. Lurie, could you do me a favor and, and grab a hold of that, that handheld mic? Oh, that's, either way, it's fine. Yeah, just uh, talk real clear. Sometimes the speakers don't speak Okay, I'll, I will try. Uh, no worries. My client said I needed to speak up earlier today, so I will try to do so. Uh, uh, but a moment ago, you discussed with the applicant's representative a report detailing the square footage calculations. Uh, I looked for that uh, earlier today at Town Hall. I was hired yesterday, last night actually. But I looked to that today in the town hall because I had questions about uh, those calculations because they were submitted in 1999 and didn't appear to be submitted in connection with this particular appeal, uh, particularly the building addition, the building um, coverage on the lot. Uh, it's kind of confusing between the impervious ratio, which uh, the client, which they were referring to a moment ago when they talked about taking out the patio area, whatever, that goes to impervious uh, surface ratio. I'd like to see the building uh, calculations, which apparently you were supplied at some point in time, uh, and just to look at those while you hear from uh, all of the concerned people. I'm sorry. Can I, can I get a copy of that? <laughs> Sorry. I'll sit down now and take a look at these while others speak. Do you have a, you have a copy of them? I do now, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lurie, before you sit down, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Sure. Uh, two things, actually. Uh, could you spell your last name first, please? L-O-U-R-I-E. L-O-U-R-I-E. Great. And it's David? David. Yes, um, that's correct. And you're, you're counsel for? I'm counsel for um, Diane and Bob who are the owners of the property nearby. Who is it, Garofalo? Uh, Ms. Garofalo and Mr. Westberg, yes. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, anybody else wish to speak to this? Hi. Good name Hi. My name is Susan Pettipiece, and I'm at 3 Cliff Street, which is next door to the property that you're discussing. Can you even spell that last name? First? Sure. It's P, as in pizza, E, T, T, A, P-I-E-C-E, -E. had a piece. Thank you. Uh -huh. Susan's um, S-U-S-A-N. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, my concern is, is basically uh, I've been to, this is my third zoning or political 
uh, meeting about Hagen's speech on the couple weeks I'm here, it's sort of different. But hearing from um, these other meetings, my concern stems from the proportion of the house to the lot and the fact that I don't know that it's going to fit in with the character of the neighborhood. The house already covers 40% of the lot, which I don't understand how that happened initially, and I have a little bit of a concern about the pervious and impervious coverage uh, because if we're taking up patios to build houses, I'm not sure that I understand exactly how that works. I'd like some clarification on that. Also, uh, we are on the shoreline, and I guess uh, that property in question is also shoreline, but I guess because this portion of the house extends back beyond the 75 feet, then the DEP regulations do not apply. That's is correct. that my understanding? Okay, uh, the meeting I went to earlier in this week indicated that most of the coverage on Higgins Beach is 35% and that uh, we were trying to bring things in line with, with that, and although this house exceeds it, um, I hate to see uh, a second floor over a garage, which will make the bulk of the building look bigger. It also obscures our view out one portion of our house because this is next to us. Um, so those are really my main concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Diane Garofalo. This is my husband, Robert Westberg. We're owner and full-time residents at 6 Houghton Street and are abutters to the property at 1 Cliff Street. When we received the appeal that was submitted, um, we reviewed the application in its entirety. Although we may not fully understand what is really trying to be achieved, we do have several concerns based on our interpretation of the ordinance, ordinances that we believe are applicable. The first point that we'd like to make is in the application it states that impacts and effects of the existing smaller garage versus the proposed garage are not substantially different height and parking are similar. Based on our understanding of what we're trying to do here, we do not agree with that, and we have photographed a majority of the garages that exist in the Higgins Beach neighborhood. Most are one bay, and there are very few that are two bays. The overwhelming majority of the garages are one story. The majority of homes have no garage. So I don't understand how it could be accurate to state that height and parking would be similar. My understanding is we're expanding to accommodate a truck and we're adding a full story. If you go to tab four, oh, I'm sorry. Tab four shows a variety of pictures of most of the garages in the neighborhood, and as you go through it, you'll see that they are one story, one bay. So if we're talking about the character of the neighborhood, a uh, two story, two bay garage would be significantly impacting the effects, in my opinion, in our opinion. In addition, um, the impact on the proposed, uh, the impact of the proposed addition would be substantial in many, too many in the immediate vicinity of our property. The expansion to two stories will result in living space above the garage, which results in a home much larger, larger than most in the community. It will not only block many of our current views in our home of the ocean, but also impact several other neighbors' views, as was indicated by the several emails and or letters that were submitted to Mr. Longstaff. If you go to tab one, you'll see the views that we currently have. The first page is the view that we currently have from the guest room on the second floor of our house. The second page is the view that we currently have from the master bedroom of our current <coughs> house. Third page is just another view from our master bedroom, and you'll note that the, that the trees are on the property at 1 Cliff Street, and the current garage is to the right, it's to the left of the, of the trees which is currently a one story, so you can so probably imagine the, what two stories would do to this view. Is that the house that's next, that we're talking about being expanded? Yes. 
and it's on that side. Yes. Okay, just real quick. Thank you. Do you everybody know what I'm talking about? Can we get that picture up too, but I don't know whether house is in reference to that. Uh, Our house is in the back. In the back. This one, when they're looking at the view, this house here is <coughs> expanded. You had the picture up there earlier with looking down the, the side <coughs> driveway. Can that be brought back for a price? Credit card? <laughs> that picture. Where's the house to the right of the garage? This is this is them. If you could move up the street a little bit more, I'd, that'd be great. And back just a little bit. There was a, where the where the garage is, where the house to the right. And the house that we're talking about changing is the one where the garage is there now. Everybody get them. That's helpful. The other things to note, uh, particularly about um, the property in question, is on the corner of Cliff Street and Houghton Street. Cliff Street has other neighbors on Cliff Street. Has on, there's only one house with a garage, and it's one bay, one story. On Houghton Street, there are 22 homes. Only seven have garages. All are one bay, one story. So that is the immediate neighborhood and the effect and impact that building a two-story, two-bay garage might have on the look and feel of the neighborhood. The existing garage is not offensive. Most neighbors do not have a garage. We do not have a garage, and we do not see a need to design a garage to accommodate a truck, nor do we understand the rationale in the application. As it stated, the owner is a year-round resident and would like protection from the winter weather. Although it may be accurate that the owner is registered as a year-round resident, from our observations, over the last three winters since we've owned our home, very little time is spent in the winter in this house. Mail is canceled for most of the winter. A caretaker frequently checks the house. A police car periodically parks in the driveway and a police officer walks around to monitor activity on the property. There are no cars left in the driveway during the winter and a private snowplow consi consistently shows up between 6 and 7 a.m. every snowstorm to clear that driveway. So we therefore really question the need for this project. I'll close by saying that we purchased our home three years ago with plans to retire in it. We do live there year round and we're currently in the middle of a major renovation. If we had known this appeal was in progress, we would never have made that move to renovate. And we're concerned. We're concerned about the impact on the loss of our views and what that would have on the value of our property. So in closing, I'd ask you to consider our concerns and our objection to this appeal. Thank you, Mr. Garfo. Mr. Westberger, do you want to add anything? What's that? Did you want to add anything, Mr. Westberger? Uh, I think she did a very good job. She did. <laughs> he was just here to carry the books. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a good job, too. Okay. Um, so anybody else wish to speak to this? Uh, we probably will do that in a minute. Are you the owner of the property? Yes, I'm Julie Barber. I live at One Cliff Street. <laughs> um, the house has been in my family since 1925. I renovated it in 1999, and in 2004, when I got married, I acquired a husband. And interestingly, between now and that time, he's a physician. He practices up in Bangor. He is going to retire. And at some point, we are going to go from a one household, you know, building home to a two a one house a two a one house a one person household to a two person household, and that's why the garage is requested. And um, in, uh, it, and uh, the room above is not to be rented out. There's not even a bathroom that's going in into it. It's for my husband's office and storage, <laughs> which we will desperately need um, when we actually combine our households. So that's some of the rationale between, behind the move. Okay. And, and Kent, while you're there, you sure. says yeah. truck. What do you mean by truck? Oh, he, he, we he's got a, a truck. He's got a big truck. We, it, does, it wouldn't fit in my garage now. So we're talking about like a pickup. Yeah, it's a pickup uh, truck. Not, not, not yeah. a semi. No, no, no. no, no, no <laughs> okay, no, just no. to make sure. To me, it looks gigantic. Oh, you know? It's like a 350 or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a Toyota Tundra. Yeah, it is. It's a Toyota Tundra. Okay. It's a truck. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to clarify that it wasn't. Truck implies to me something other than a personal vehicle. Oh, okay. That's all. So I just wanted to get a clarification on that. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else you'd like to add? 
no, unless there are any other questions. There probably will be. Okay. Anybody else in public want to speak? <coughs> Okay, we'll close the public portion of this. Oops, oh, Mr. Lori, yes, yeah, sure. Can you restate your name and address? Thank you. Yes, my name is David Lori. I live in Cape Elizabeth. I'm an attorney. Um, I've been here before, but the last time was 10 years ago on a setback. Uh, appeal which got uh, appealed to the Superior Court and ultimately the board decision was upheld in that case but uh, now I'm here on the opposite side uh, and uh, I was hired only yesterday uh, by Diane and Diane Gar Garofalo and Bob Westberg who are the immediate abutters on Houghton Street and are going to be severely impacted by the particularly by the two um, two-story garage. Uh, the, you take a look at those pictures that were circulated and imagine looking out uh, with the garage, which is shown um, on many of those pictures, imagine that being two stories. Uh, I have a, a kind of technical question as to whether uh, the building was actually erected uh, prior to 1991. This is kind of an odd case because it was substantially rebuilt and uh, expanded in 1999 and that's uh, perhaps something I just want to throw out here as to whether uh, that's what the ordinance was intended which has that 1991 date was intended to cover, whether it was intended to cover a house like this which was in fact substantially expanded after after that date anyway. But let me uh, move on because uh, you probably won't want to deal, need, you probably won't need to deal with that issue anyway. Um, the 1999 um, additions were made with, as I said earlier, I looked at the, I looked at the building inspection files and, uh, and assessors files earlier in the day and the, that addition was made in 1998, 1999, sorry, uh, based upon a 1998 zoning issues study. And I have copies of it here that I'm going to give you. There are other documents as well in the file. I won't burden you with all of them, all talking about how the percentage of lot coverage, building coverage, was being raised to uh, 25%. Yeah, we'll hand them down. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question I raised earlier had to do with the space and bulk regulations. Uh, the building uh, lot coverage uh, back then, back in 1998, and this is what they built to in 1999, uh, went from 21.7 percent to uh, 25 percent, which is the maximum, and that was done with the addition of 249 square feet of previously unbuilt coverage is what it said. So they're at the maximum after the construction in 1999. What they have, there is no comparable calculation. The calculation that I was handed a little while ago when I asked about it is actually an impervious surface ratio uh, and it reflects the fact that uh, the part of the patio is going to be removed now um, and that that's where they get their uh, space from. Now that's, as I say, that's an impervious uh, surface ratio issue, you know, that outside patio area uh, and other things which are being given up are substantially less than what is proposed to be, proposed to be added 
Uh, I haven't got any exact calculations because it was difficult for me to do that from the plans that were actually submitted. Uh, but uh, it does show um, the new application shows a substantially larger garage being proposed beyond the two, 32, sorry, 320 feet uh, of the existing garage, which is going to be demolished. It's going to be much bigger, as well as an addition um, uh, of a new entry. Um, and uh, I don't know where those numbers come from, since they're already at the maximum for building coverage. And uh, certainly the answer is not to be found in these lot coverage calculations which I was handed here because uh, they're based on impervious surface and talks about the 40% coverage rule for the requirement or maximum uh, for impervious surface when in fact uh, there's a 25% maximum for building coverage. So that's one discrepancy which you should look at. Um, the uh, as I said, there's no comparable uh, calculation offered with respect to building um, uh, building air area coverage. Uh, you heard before from my clients that, and, and from uh, Ms. Uh, Barber, that she is not currently a year-round resident, but hopes to be someday. Well, maybe when she is, uh, it might be that uh, the need for a larger garage, a two-car garage, can be justified. Uh, I don't think my clients would be here opposing this. They certainly wouldn't be paying me to come here to oppose this if they're only asking for a two-car garage versus a one-car garage and moving it backwards um, arguably makes the lot less non-conforming. That's one side of it. Of course, they're going up to a second story within the non area of nonconformity. Uh, every case I've been, ever been involved in uh, where the code officer uh, ruled on that, uh, he always said that that was increasing the nonconformity if you put a second story on, on top of uh, a one-story intrusion into the required setback. And I think it can be argued that, in fact, they're increasing the nonconformity here rather than decreasing it, but uh, you can deal with that if you choose. Uh, I don't, you know, my opinion is that this is an increase in nonconformity or at least, or at best, a wash in terms, it doesn't, certainly doesn't improve the conformity of the lot generally. Um, the applicant uh, says, that uh, many of the older homes in the neighborhood have small detached garages. That's actually an argument against what they're proposing because they're not proposing a small detached garage. Or even a small attached garage, I think my clients would have no problem with that. What they're talking about is a two-story garage, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, the, Uh, there is one property put into evidence uh, which, uh, support, which supports uh, meeting the ordinance requirement uh, that, the prop, that the use being proposed is essentially the same manner as other similar properties in the area. There's only one house identified as uh, tending to support that claim. Uh, and obviously, there's got to be more than one if you're t claiming that uh, it's prevalent in the area, which is the assertion, uh, but the, is not borne out by the uh, evidence. Uh, the applicant clearly has not met their burden of proof on that issue. And if they did, uh, Bob Westberg's pictures and his uh, testimony concerning uh, other properties having one vehicle garages, if any garage in the area, uh, certainly rebuts any inference you could draw supporting that conclusion. Uh, the neighborhood impact, or the impact, the applicant states that the impacts and effects of the smaller detached garage 
are versus the proposed two-car garage are not substantially are substantially the same. They obviously are not. You can tell that from the pictures. Uh, the impact of a second story is very telling. Whether it's a one-car garage or two-car garage, uh, I don't think my clients care that much about that issue. It's a second story, which is unacceptable. Uh, and uh, it's not borne out that this is a prevalent, uh, let alone a predominant, uh, usage within the zoning district. No evidence supporting that conclusion. Uh, the height uh, of the new garage will obliterate many of the views currently enjoyed by my clients. Just take a look at those pictures and imagine that roof uh, structure next to the tree being twice as high as it is, and uh, you'll see what our problem is. Mr. Lurie, just to stop you there for one moment, if you don't mind. Um, not to be difficult, but we also know that Nobody's guaranteed a right for a view. That's right. So do you want to tackle some of your points regarding, as opposed to just hitting the point of the view and tie, well, to, the, tie to the ordinance issues? Because I just want to make sure you, you get your chance to cover it all. Well, yes, I, I appreciate that. Uh, the question, though, is, first of all, whether this is a prevalent use in the area, having a second-story garage is a prevalent use in the in the neighborhood, and clearly they've not met their burden on that issue. In terms of the impact, it says the impact on neighboring properties or the neighborhood. Uh, they're not only my clients, but other people are affected by the height of the, by the height increase proposed. It isn't a matter of having a legal right to a view. It's a matter of your assessing the impact of the proposed development. Uh, and I, I think that that's something that the board has to do. Uh, it's not my, my client doesn't have an easement for a view. It's just, they don't have a right to uh, go to court to stop this process on the basis of a, any kind of easement or, or nuisance claim. Uh, but it is within your purview to address impacts on the neighborhood of allowing this and others, perhaps in the future, other second-story uh, second garages being put up on adjacent properties and their views. This is a waterfront neighborhood. Uh, those water views are important. They're, they add to the value and utility of the property, of not only this property, but they're prevalent in the area. And uh, if my clients propose to build up uh, on their present structure, uh, their neighbors would be here complaining, and that's uh, how to put it. Uh, when they're when you're here on a setback reduction appeal, that is one of the criteria which I think the board has to consider. It isn't necessarily determinative, but it's something to be considered. Uh, and as I said before, uh, my clients uh, want to be good neighbors. They don't want to be here opposing this. They, didn't want, they certainly don't want to pay me to come here to oppose this. But the bottom line is they feel they have to do that because of the second story proposed. Uh, if this application is turned down, uh, they can come in with something substantially different, which moves, uh, which gives them a two-car garage uh, and headroom for storage. I mean, there, there would be some storage, presumably, under the eaves or in, you know, in a normal garage. I have some storage above in my garage. And, uh, you know, I don't think you need to have uh, a whole area, uh, you know, for storage and, muck and an office uh, in order to have a two-car garage. And as I said before, that's the principal objection that my clients have to this process. Uh, we wish that uh, uh, they had been given an opportunity to discuss this with the client, with, with uh, Ms. Barber, before she came in with this application, and then they're put in a position where they have to come in and oppose it. Uh, but that didn't happen. They weren't aware of this until the application was filed already. And uh, I, I think you need to deny this because it does not meet the ordinance criteria. 
Uh, and also, I think that uh, the uh, building coverage issue um, means that this permit can't be granted anyway, regardless of what you do tonight, without proof that uh, the building coverage issue has been properly addressed. And there are figures from uh, 1999 which show that they're already at the maximum. They certainly are increasing the building coverage, uh, giving up some outside impervious surface doesn't mitigate that, doesn't even go to that issue, and what they've supplied you with uh, doesn't address the issue of building coverage at 25% maximum. And, uh, you know, even if you approve this tonight, and I certainly hope you will not, uh, they could not be issued a permit uh, unless they can demonstrate, as they did in 1999, that they don't exceed the maximum. And they must exceed the maximum since they're already there in 1999, and they are at, obviously adding additional, um, additional building coverage. Sorry. Um, so I will sit down and see if you have any questions for me before I do so. Uh, there probably will be, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anybody else wish to speak to this? All set. I'm going to close the public part of this meeting and come back to um, um, Ms. Joyner. Could you please take the microphone, please? W were you aware of some of the challenges in the neighborhood when you were designing this? Or we Absolutely. Weren't? You no. were? Okay. Yes. I think we, what we're here for tonight is the reduced side yard setback. Lot coverage is a building permit issue. It's been addressed here, but obviously if, if, if we find that's not accurate, then we wouldn't be given a permit. So it's really not an argument for tonight, although it is documented here showing that we are maintaining the same non-vegetated lot coverage. I do have I gotta, a... I gotta stop you there. There is, there is a reason that we want to know that because yeah. typically we don't allow in these kind of things any more than what is already being used as a, as a building. Um, Absolutely. And so that by itself would force us to, all by itself, right, but might that's force us into having to postpone this and get some more information. Okay, but that's a building permit no. issue. It's, it's, it's not it's a variance issue. It's right. important. Sure. It's okay, important. Um, so I do have the lot coverage report that talks about the non-vegetated surface. I have a survey from 1998 that shows the entire building, um, the same footprint as what we're starting with today. So I don't know when exactly, I know your renovation was in 99, so um, this whole building to some degree was there in 1998 when they did this survey. So I believe the numbers are, are accurate. Um, as far as the impact, I wanted to address that because that's question four and, and a lot of it, we, we heard a lot about how it impacts, impacts, and yes, it impacts because of the second story. The question is, the impact will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. So that's saying if we were at 15 and at 30, would it be significantly different? The answer is no. It would be a different shaped building, but the height would not necessarily be any different than what we're proposing. So that's why that impact statement, you've got to relate it to what the question is asking. Would it be different if we didn't get the reduction? Not significantly if we're trying to do the same thing. We would just have a smaller garage, but we could still do the height because we're under the ordinances. Um, so that was my response to that. The views they confuse me a little bit. I actually think the neighbors directly behind are going to have a slightly better view because the garage will be lined up with a house, skewed away from them, and, and, and much further away. So I think I that also. I don't know who that is. Well, that's yeah. the, um, the people who are speaking here. The, the view that's on screen. Yeah. So if you look at the plot plan that shows the proposed new garage and the existing garage to be removed, I think they have a potential for some improvement on that front side view. Um, as far as a two-story impacting, it's no taller than the building that's there as far as the peak of the roof goes. So there already is that height that they're dealing with. Um, this new garage 
starts on the neighbor's side, starts with a four foot high wall, and the pitch of the roof matches the house, which is about an 812 pitch. So it's not a full two story with a roof. It starts at four feet with a moderate slope, and the peak of the roof matches the peak of the house that it's attaching to, which is shorter than the peak of the main house, slightly shorter than the peak of the main house. So I, the, the views, I think, I, I don't know who's getting impacted and if it's an actual view issue. And I think the people that are most close to this actually would get a better view from that side just because of the new location. Um, some people questioned renting the apartment. I mentioned this in the beginning. The access to that room over the garage is through a bedroom. So there's no way that that would ever conceivably be rentable space. There's no bathroom there. There's no plumbing out there. Um, may or not, may not be heating. I, I don't know at this point if we're even going to heat it. But there's no bathroom. And you have to get to it through a bedroom. So that does not make sense that it would ever be used as space to rent, even that it's even an option. And that's the only way to get to that space. Um, they mentioned being too close together, houses being too close together. One of the letters, I think, mentioned that. And like I said, we're actually moving this from being two foot off the property line to being essentially 11 feet off the property line on the side. So that's a significant improvement um, from being too close together. Um, lot coverage we talked about. I think I hit all the issues that I made notes on. So if if you need some clarification on any of those, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, why don't we start off with the, um, the requirements. Um, stay right up there, it'll be great. Uh, number one, I'll read it in and then you can respond, okay? Sure. Under the statute, I actually have a right to cross the family that we've Actually, right now we've closed the public hearing. Uh, however, out of respect, we're pretty flexible with things like that. But at this point, what I'd like to do is go through the the, the items, and uh, I have no problem with with an honest debate handled properly. So we'll let you come back, okay? Um, the existing buildings or structures on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is re uh, requested were erected prior to 1991, or the lot is a vacant, non-conforming lot of record. And if you'd like to state your, your position on that, that'd be great. Um, the original house was built in 1925. It's been in the same family since then. So it's obviously before 1991. Do you want to, ex the, to comment on the, the, the building in 1999 and uh, the changes? Well, I wasn't involved in that, but um, maybe Julie can speak to that. Do you want to speak to that if you'd did like you, to? Did you, if you take oh, the microphone again. Did you actually name, increase please. or just renovate what was there? Uh, the 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 existing structure didn't change. I gutted it and put in insulation, new windows, new heating system, um, and changed the, the wall configuration. And then an area that was a shed, I finished that, made that a two-story addition so I could get another bedroom upstairs. Okay. So, so it's a two-bedroom house with three bathrooms. In 99, the footprint didn't change? Oh, it did. Yeah, there was an addition on the back. So the initial, the original structure didn't change, but there was a, where the den is. Um, is that where the shed was or not? Yeah, that's where the shed where used the shed to be. Was, so, that was so, so there was yeah, footprint. Yeah, the shed was attached to the building, yeah. So there was footprint there. You Correct. just, you Correct. didn't increase that? A little bit. Um, I think I rounded it, I mean, I squared it off at the end. I'd have to go back to the original. The den is in this area, if I'm not mistaken, if you look at the screen. Correct, yeah. That's right. Is that in the, uh, in the, uh, There's uh, probably the area the, that, uh, I don't know how to do this. I'd like to make a survey if anybody needs to see that. That's okay. Thank you. So does that answer the question of footprint? I'm not sure yet. We just, uh, we just want to, I'm going to have another couple on that if you don't mind just for a second here. That looks like it. Did you have to come to the zoning board to get that done, or were you able to just go through the... the I'm uh, pretty sure it went to the zoning board. Did it? Would you? Uh -huh. That would be great. Thank you. Um, we'll get the file from that date, and then that'll help a little bit, I think. 
I, I honestly do not know the answer. I'm going to have to defer to the uh, code enforcement officer regarding the 1999. The 1999 was uh, Wait, excuse me, Chairman. What was your question? Did I come to the zoning? The, the zoning board. The is a permit. It, no, I, it was a permit. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just came for a permit? Yeah. Well, well, do you want me to get that? Yeah, why don't we get that? That would be great. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, the renovation of an existing structure and right. and not uh, I think where the den area was, if that was a shed, it appears to meet setbacks, so there probably right, wasn't right. any need to come I mean, for a variance that's right. on that. Yeah. And it was an attached shed at the time? Pardon me? It was an attached yeah, shed at the time? Yeah, it was a time. bathroom and a shower, yeah. refrigerator, washer yeah. dryer. No, no. And, and a renovation doesn't doesn't uh, screw up the, the uh, July 3rd, 1991 Deadline. Right. The original right. structure was still there. You can renovate it until the cows come home, and that's not going to change that. Right. Um, if I you tear it down, that. completely remove it, yeah, it goes away. But that isn't what I understood the project oh. to be. No. You mean the renovation? In 1998. No. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Same. It looks the same before the renovation. Okay. And it's just for, for the that shed area that was built up to. Thank you. And, and just so the, the, the chair, uh, the, the board knows, I, I'm not sure how the permit was reviewed in 1998. I wasn't even doing code enforcement until 1999. So I don't know how whoever reviewed the permit was. What I do know is that the entire property is in the shoreland zone. In the shoreland zone, you are limited to 20% non veg. I do not ever say impervious surface to me again. It's non <laughs> vegetated area, okay? And that includes structures and other non-vegetated area. So it's 20%. Obviously, the building exceeded that in at the time that the shoreland zoning became an ordinance in the town. Right. So it, it already was over. The policy is you do not increase what you have. You can keep what you have. You cannot increase it. Um, I don't know how that was reviewed. I know that the underlying zone <coughs> requires or has a maximum of 25% building coverage, mm -hmm. that goes out the window because shoreland zone includes non-vegetated area. And so when you calculate up all the non-vegetated area, I think what the applicant and her designer were trying to do was not to increase the non-vegetated area. Shoreland zoning does not um, have a building max, it has a non-vegetated area max. So we're looking at that whole non-vegetated area and that's the difference between the R4 underlying zone and the shoreland zone. The R4 underlying zone wouldn't take into account any of the driveways or any of the patios or any of the other uh, non-vegetated areas. So that lot calculation page that I gave to the lawyer is documenting the non-vegetated surface it of the existing the and of the proposed and showing that it did not increase, 40%, 40%. It, and that's and in your package. And just to add on to that, and I'm sorry, just to add on to that, <coughs> it is common practice to uh, reclaim non-vegetated area to make it vegetated in order to, I mean, that's the whole goal of shoreland zoning is to keep vegetation in that 250-foot buffer. So that's a common practice. I'm not saying that it always works great because lawn isn't necessarily a great vegetated buffer, but it is vegetated, and I can't draw any distinction between lawn and trees. This is one of the few lots down in Higgins Beach that actually has trees, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help the neighbor's view, but it is a good thing from a shoreland perspective. So I just wanted to draw those distinctions there. And I also think it's fair to say, you know, people are, were saying that there are a lot of single detached garages in the neighborhood. Yes, there are. I think it's fair to say if people had enough space on their lot, they would have a bigger garage, but that's all they have the space for. This is a photograph of a house one street over. That's a very similar um, house with a garage. And that's the only example I found of a similar one. But um, it's there. And, and like I said, if they had space on their property, they would do what they could do. Okay, thank you. So, so let's go back to the, uh, the requirements. The request for reduction is reasonably uh, necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. I'd like to read that, your comment in that. We, we need to get this on public record, so that's why I'm having Okay, can you read that again? Sure, it's number two. Number two. And it's on your page four. Okay, your that's why. Okay. Um, 
the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Okay, so I'll read my response. The requested reduction will allow the owner to construct an attached garage. The owner is a year-round resident and would like protection from winter weather. Many of the older homes in the neighborhood have small detached garages. There's a similar attached two-bay garage with room above at the corner of Bayview and Ocean. That was a photograph I just brought over. Okay, and the next one is due to the physical features of the lot and or the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. Right, the attached, the, the existing detached garage, like I said, is two feet from the property line. So if we were to expand that in order to get a two-bay garage, we would actually be in a worse conforming situation than what we are trying to do with new construction. So here's my answer to that, my written answer. Due to the location of the existing house, it would not be possible to constru construct a new garage without the reduced yard size. A new garage meaning of the size that we're trying to, to do, a two-bay garage. The owner would prefer new construction due to the condition and location of the existing garage. The existing detached garage is located closer to the property lines than the proposed new garage would be. The proposed construction would be improving the nonconformance. The impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. The impacts and effects of a smaller garage versus the proposed garage is not substantially different. Height and parking are similar. The reduction of the yard size allows the garage to be large enough to accommodate a truck on one side. The second bay will accommodate a small car. And the applicant has not commenced construction. Correct. And um, if Mr. Uh, 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 yes, if you would please. And again, state your name, Ms. Lori. David Lori. Uh, the question I was going to ask the applicant, I'll wait for a minute on. Uh, I'd like to respectfully disagree with the opinion you got from your code officer. I hesitate to pick a fight with a code officer before a Board of Appeals, but the shoreland zoning restrictions are supposed to be more restrictive than the underlying zone. And there are provisions in your ordinance which say that where there are conflicting provisions, the more restrictive applies. And I, I think that uh, uh, the... Uh, Underlying 25% building limitation, uh, building lot, building on lot limitation, doesn't go out the window. It's still there, uh, you know, in the underlying zone, and it has to be enforced um, by the by the town. I think the good news is I think he did say that. That's what I heard. I thought he said it went out the we're window when we get into Shoreland. We're having a difference of opinion on which is more restrictive, okay. and I consider the the, the fact that. In the shoreland zone, you throw in non-vegetated surface in addition to building coverage. In, in the underlying zone, it's only building and coverage, building coverage, and you could cover the whole lot with pavement if you wanted to, and it wouldn't count. So I consider the fact that non-vegetation is thrown in as being more restrictive. Well, that may, be more, that, may be more, that may be true in the abstract. Here, you probably have compliance with one provision but not with the other. The fact that uh, they managed to comply with the uh, uh, non-vegetative surface requirement by getting rid of a patio doesn't mean that by getting rid of that patio, they get to increase, and this is what they've done, they've increased the building coverage, which they already said was at 25% already, the maximum, in their, in their 1999 filings. So I think that uh, as applied, uh, clearly, it's in violation or would be in violation for the town to issue a permit for this particular proposal. Now, as I said before, my clients are not that concerned about building coverage and could live with a two-car garage there, no doubt. Uh, you know, if it were moved back and if it were not a second story. Uh, the question I was going to ask to the applicant, 
was uh, because Ms. Joyner seemed to be saying that the proposed garage would be no higher than the existing garage, which you see pictures of uh, the views. The existing house. The existing house. Said, okay. Yes, but I, I thought that she was implying that it, would, it wouldn't be any worse than the existing garage, well, which is not, not the case, certainly. And I'm glad you, you clarified that now. Any other Thank comments you. or questions? Any other comments or questions? Uh, no, I think I've made my points. Thank you. Okay, okay. so uh, we've gone through the requirements. We've done the, uh, the closed hearing, public hearing. Then I come to the board with comments, questions, concerns. I'll throw one right off the bat uh, that I think is a major stumbling block. I don't think we can vote on this tonight because we do not have the lot, we do not have the property measurements uh, on here. We do not know what, what we do know. It is expanding, and I it can't expand uh, the footprint. So I'm just talking strictly footprint. Uh, and I thank you for doing the calculation, um, uh, Mr. Lazell. I'm not positive whether or not it's accurate or not, but it certainly implies somewhere around 356 feet. Elijah, and it's really not the app. It's really not the board's job to figure out calculations. But I think it was you. 352, Mr. Chair, but that's okay. <laughs> thank you. You want to borrow my glasses? <laughs> Boy, it's sorry, proud. I'm sorry. So uh, I'll tell you right off the bat. In my opinion, that forces us, no matter what, to a uh, to table this for more information, unless the applicant can provide something that indicates otherwise. And I don't see that here. That being said, I think we should still continue to vet the issue and, and play the handout. Does anybody disagree with that logic? I'm fine with that. I, I agree with that, and I have a question for uh, Mr. Longstaff okay. around building coverage versus, versus non-vegetated uh -huh. area coverage. Is it 25% or 20? Could you just which? Um, how about building coverage? Building coverage in the R4 underlying zone yep. is 25%. 25% building coverage. Correct. In the shoreland zone, it's 20% non vegetated surface. Now, to the question that the, the I forgot, the, Mr. Lori, is that correct? Asked, do we know the building coverage before this change for that property? Do I we do have that number? I have that figure. That would be a number we would need. Yeah, there right. was not, I did not see a number for, uh, it, it may be in the file, I'd have to examine the file. I was under the impression that the footprint, the remodel didn't increase the original footprint of the house. As I looked through the notes, I didn't see that there was an increase because I didn't see it noted anywhere. If that was in fact the case and it happened in 1999, then that's after shoreland zoning was in place and that would count, you, you don't, you don't, it's cumulative at that point. Every increase right. in square footage is accumulative, and you only get to, to go to 20%. You were already over it, I think, with the original structure. So that kind of flew out the window at that point. But if, if that happened in 99, that would, some, that would factor into what we can approve, um, which would mean, again, you can exchange, but you can't have more. It w there was never a question in my mind that this addition was going to create more building space. I wasn't looking at it that way. I was looking at the fact that where the old garage was would be revegetated, because you're not going to you're not going to continue driveway out there. So that's going to be area non vegetated surface. Right. You're going to get back. Right. There's also some patio out back that they were going to get back. So it was a wash on non vegetated surface as to which came first, the chicken or the egg, which is more restrictive. Right. Um, I'm, I'm certainly willing to listen. I, I think there are merits to your argument. I think there's merits to my argument. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think but, the, but we can probably get a determination on that, and maybe it comes back to the board as an administrative appeal in, in determining whether I made an error as a code enforcement officer. Believe me, I've, I've made a few. But to the point of, and I hate to agree I with I know lawyers, lawyers don't make mistakes. Nothing, code nothing officers personal, Mr. Lorre. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lori, I hate to agree with you, but if if it was at 25% before this modification is attempted in building coverage, and that's the maximum coverage, and they want to add 352 feet of building plan by going to a two bay, then 
if they're at 25% already for building coverage, they can increase it, and I think that's a valid point. Well, that's what I'm saying. My yeah. interpretation is that the, tw the uh, lot coverage, the non-vegetated surface coverage, trumps the building area coverage because that's not even included in the, in the, in the underlying. I agree with you 100%. percent so, so, there so there's a difference of opinion there. I'm no. not saying I'm right or wrong. No, what I'm, I'm saying that's how I reviewed it. But my point, I guess my point is if it's currently at 25% with the building envelope as it sits today, they can't add more building because they're at 25% already. I'm, that's not the way I'm interpreting it. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm not interpreting it that way. Okay. <laughs> so, so that would need to be ironed out. Yeah, I, and I think what we'd want to do is at least talk to the legal services and say, uh, what I mean, is the point? I mean, historically, when we talk about anything that requires a a, um, a variance of any type, mm -hmm. we usually don't allow extra square footage in any case. So, from but again. I'll say it one more time. Again, I'm looking at non-vegetated surface. It's a wash because they're revegetating surface in, a, in, in compensation for the additional building area. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Right. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm wrong. That's how I reviewed it. So in that regard, you have always allowed that. You have always allowed them to come back and revegetate to take more area for a home that was in a paved driveway or a patio. You've done that before. That's how I was reviewing it. Okay. Yeah. Just to be clear, yeah. I'm not mad at you. I'm being demonstrative. <laughs> I, I'm okay? the demonstrative. I like it I'm when you're mad at you, at but I'm not. Yeah, mad I, was say, <laughs> I kind of like it when you're mad at me, but that's all right. Okay. So if you're right, they they. I'm adding they, emphasis. <laughs> if you're right, they basically it's a wash. If you're not right, then they can't do anything. They'd have to stay within the same. Yeah, but, but remember, they've got a garage there that they're tearing down. That same square footage could be added to the house because that was part of the original 25% or the 25% right. max. Just I'm assuming. Just couldn't go I'm, I'm assuming. More. Again, upon examination, they could. Closer examination of the file. Uh, okay. It's just footprint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, if they took that same garage footprint and attached it to the house, they could go up two stories. Right. If, because they would then be within the buildable envelope. They'd right. meet the 15-foot setback. But, but true, true enough. They're expanding the garage to a, a two-bay garage. That's the request for the limited reduction of yard size. Right. And I am tracking with you. It, I got you. And, and, and let's just say that they could get the limited reduction of yard size with the, the roof sloping up at, at 15 feet. They're allowed 35 feet. Right. So, it, I mean, something could be built that would be just as unacceptable to the neighborhood, but could be done in a compliant way, potentially. Yeah. Just to be clear. Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and this view would always be there no matter what. This view would still remain. Uh, I'm can sorry, you, you got to approach the... Yeah, uh, actually, right, right now we've, we've closed, closed the public the hearing. hearing section. Sorry. Part. So right now we can't, but we're, we're still having a debate on the issue, and I think... Uh, Mark, we still, we still have a few more uh, um, Right now I've got to leave it closed. I let the attorney for you go up. It's your attorney, so I let your attorney go up, out of respect. But it's not policy. No respect to me? I love you. <laughs> but he's your attorney. <laughs> 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 All right, so here's here's... Some of my quick comment concerns. Number one, I'm disappointed. Uh, I'll be honest with the applicant. I'm disappointed the applicant didn't work with the neighborhood. I think that was a mistake. I think it's always a mistake. Um, I don't think you did yourself any justice that way. Um, the the issue I think at hand comes down to being where are they going to approve or decline this based on the merits of what's required here. That being said. There's a lot of interpretation that's pretty gray in that. You're right. In fact, you could then take and do a spike garage and move it over and build up just to prove a point that people have done that before. It won't be the first time. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that that hasn't that hasn't that dialogue didn't happen. My personal advice, based on the fact that I don't see any way around other than tabling this is that you do get together with your neighbors and work it out. Because I don't think, it's a, I don't think this is an appropriate venue for that. We'll do it, but I don't think it's an appropriate venue. 
Um, as I've said earlier, though, that nobody has a right to a view. So, but you can interpret any one of these items to a change in character, change in name, in, in, in uh, other issues as being a reason to decline. They're going to meet all six of these, the five of these, I'm sorry. So those are my immediate concerns. I personally think this is just like number one. I think we've got exactly where we were with the first appeal. I don't see any difference. Um, and that's, in my opinion, based on that, not good for you. <laughs> I'm just candid. I mean, that's, that's my opinion. Now, again, you can come back and, and fall in line, not even have to come to us and build up there, and you can do that. But that seems destructive. Um, I know the neighborhood well, and you do too. Um, I, I don't think that's a good plan. I would prefer that the board needs some, need some information and clarification, but I'd like to hear the rest of the board talk about what their concerns or uh, support is for this project. So I'll shut up at this point. Yeah, I, I think we need to clarify which way it is, one way or the other, if it's the building or impervious services or whatever we're calling it. Or we, need to, we need to come up with what number and what percentage is, in fact, the law for us to go by. And I, I agree with the chair. We, we have people from Higgins Beach come before us all the time, and it's so much easier when you involve your neighbors. It makes it easier for us. It makes it easier for you. It's just that much of an easier project because you don't have people hiring lawyers and going out and doing other things and having a whole bunch of people come in to speak against it. it. It does benefit you. So it might behoove you to try to talk to the neighbors a little bit. Other members of the board? No, I, I agree. I think we, are, we need an illegal, a legal opinion before we... Uh, what about any concept regarding the concept itself or any of the items? I... I, I I think the addition of, of a larger footprint, I, I don't think we can do it. That was, there again, w w if once we get a legal opinion on that, maybe we can, but I'm, I'm kind of against it right now the way it is. I agree. Mr. Longstaff, are you still waiting? There was mention of it, it, it goes to the more restrictive, more restrictive, whether it's shore land or it's the town. So if it was the town and not the shore land, you wouldn't be able to grant this, is, is that correct? You would not be able to grant an increase in building coverage at this point. So that argument that goes in the if, we had, if, if I had the determination that it was already at 25%, yes. I would not be able to. You would not be able to do that. If, that if there was no shoreland zone involved. Okay. That's true. Okay. If the original structure was at 28%, then they could have 28%. If the original structure was at 30%, they could have 30%. But in the town's eyes, if, if, if they're at 25% in the, in the zoning and, and then they want to increase the building size, then you wouldn't allow that because they've already they've already maxed that right. out. Yep. Okay. Correct. But the, it, whereas they're using lot swap, they're doing the non-vegetative swap right. essentially, yep. where it encompasses everything, the pavement, the building. So you wouldn't, it wouldn't, as a default, go back to the more restrictive. That's what I'm getting at. Is that keep asking the same question, Bob? Yeah, you keep asking the same question. I'm going to give you the same answer. <laughs> don't. I tried it already. Don't. <laughs> Do you want me to emphasize my answer one more time? <laughs> I reviewed it with non-vegetated surface as, as as the maximum, not the building coverage, because building coverage is included in the non-vegetated right. surface. The, the information that was presented to me said 40% was what it was. That's what they were adhering to. That's what I was looking for. Were they going over the 40%? The information they provided said no. That's what I reviewed it under. Okay. Okay? Not building coverage, not vegetated surface. Okay. Okay? Yep. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I think the other thing, too, is seeing all the pictures, it seems like it's more of the norm for a one-car garage down there. If any. If any. And I didn't see, we only had one picture that I think was presented showing a two-car garage with the same type of style as the structure. That would concern me. I agree. Other questions down to the center? Comments? Do you really want me to speak? Yes. Are you sure? You don't have a question for Brian. You just don't ask Brian. No, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> talking to Brian anymore. I don't like talking to him. 
Um, some of the things that I've heard from the public, and I want to address some of these comments that we've heard as, as the night has gone on. Um, rental living space over the garage, I, th I heard that as one of the concerns from the people that spoke from the public. I think based on what the applicant is showing us that it's not meant to be rental space. So I think the concerns around that should die because I don't think that was the intent. Um, another one I heard was the, the volume space, that someone was concerned about the volume space increasing. I think that's legitimate and that's something we should cover when we review this more is the volume that's going to change and whether that falls under the four questions of criteria that we have to answer. And I think that's going to be debatable amongst us whether that is part of that criteria or not. But I think that will come up when we speak to that. Um, square foot for, versus the building and impervious surface. I, I think that came up from the, the people as well. And I think what, I, what we ought to do I'm not going to. I'm not talking to Brian. Uh, <laughs> what I think we ought to do in that case, Mr. Chair, is I think we should get some legal advice from uh, the town whether we are talking about impervious, non-vegetated uh, non surface versus building surface. So I think it'd be worth getting their opinion on on where we I sit think, on that. I think about the imper impervious, we should also check on the. Uh -huh. Don't go down that path. Um, the view blocking. The difficult part around view blocking is that. It's around interpretation of how it fits in these four questions. I think we had an argument from the lawyer that said that's part of our review. And I think that in the past it has not been part of our review, that that's not one of the questions that we go over. So that's one thing that we need to debate a little bit more about because we haven't in the past worked on view blocking. That's, that's not part of the decision process for us. Character of the neighborhood, that was another thing I heard pop up. That is not a question that we cover under here, but the question is whether it falls in the four questions. Uh, character falls under a previous or a different, I can't remember, uh, uh, hardship question, not under this typically. But there is a question that you can interpret whether it falls under, and I think it's three, question three, whether it fits. Uh, 1999's expansion, I'd like to see better numbers on that. To see to clarify that okay. it, it's okay. It's still nice. Anyway. Okay, good. And, and I think that was it. But again, I agree. We should table and get some more information so we could produce. Just to add on to something you said, Mr. Yeah. Luzell, is, is that even though we haven't looked at the view thing so much, this kind of does get back to similar to the first appeal that we heard in where the massing of the structure kind of is part and parcel of that view thing. You don't right. necessarily look at the view, but is the massing appropriate? I think we've got to apply the same kind of <coughs> intent as we did in the first appeal in that this is a little different because they're trying to add on to an existing house rather than taking structures away and building new. Right. But there are, and there are some challenges with that, but is it, is it kind of meeting what we're looking for in that sort of character of Higgins Beach. I agree with that statement because you, I mean if you I think you'd come if you'd come back with we want a single car garage, one level and we want storage over the top of it without a living space, I don't think you'd have an argument from the public. But I think because of the physical size of it, people are worried. They see it as two car garage with a second story and I think that puts fear in people because they don't know the effect of that. So uh, I think it's just a result of you, communication certainly helps. If you have these open discussions, as the chair, chairman talked about before, it puts the uh, worries to people away. But without that open discussion, they feel like they've been slighted, and they feel like they're taking the views away, and, they, and they're being taken advantage of. So I think that's where they're coming from. I, I'm not being there, but I'm guessing. The, um, as I said to Mr. Westberg, I, I can't even speak. Not at this time. This is a void conversation at this point. I, just as I told Mr. Westberg, I have to yeah. do the same. And that's why I stopped Mr. Westberg, so that we wouldn't get a whole bunch. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple of comments on, on I'm going to just go through this one through five. The existing buildings are structured a lot. That meets it, we're okay there. So I, I check one off as yes, okay? Number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property and essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. I have to be candid, I do not see that even coming close to meeting that. Now, if you came back to me and everybody was fine and you wanted a two-car garage and it met all the other rules and it 
got you where you needed to get. Um, I'd overlook it, probably, because it's not it's not making a huge difference. You could you've got a beautiful home and a, and a, and a that was just remodeled, and a garage. Good. I don't think you meet the requirements that's reasonably necessary to, to occupant to enjoy the property in essentially the same manner. Now, would can I be some, okay with it? Can I add some detail to that, Mr. Yeah, Chair? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the point that the, Mr. Chair is making is if you look at the photos that were handed out by one of the people from the public, I would say 99 or 90, 95 percent of those were single car garages without living space over the top, and there was one that was presented by the applicant that had a two car garage with, I believe, living space over it. So I think what he's saying, it says, the request is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant to pro of the property to use it and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner. And he's saying the majority of the essentially the same manner is a single car garage at one level, not a two car garage with living space over the top. Am, am I incorrect? That's right. Although I okay. probably would be okay with a two car garage if it didn't have a living area above because I can understand, you know, I don't have a huge we, – our goal isn't to be penalizing or, or, or punishing or even rewarding behavior. Our goal is to follow the ordinance the best we can. But that being said, we do have some room to move. And if it becomes a win-win, life is a lot easier for us. When it's a win-lose, life becomes more difficult, and I don't like that. And, and to add, in addition to what the chair is saying, one of the purposes of this board being a quasi-judicial group is that we're trying to keep the town out of legal action. And if you have the discussions out front and there isn't complaints and you've worked it out with the people of the public, then we know there's less likelihood that there's going to be legal action. But clearly there's a show of, call it force or concern, and we have to keep the town out of legal action. That's what we're here for. And, and uh, I'll follow up one step further. We've had a great record with uh, legal action in the past. I think we've won every case that's ever gone. Uh, and challenged us. I do think we had to clarify on one or two. Uh, but that being said, um, it's expensive. It's expensive for the applicant. It's expensive for the neighbors. It's expensive for the town. And I'll probably put odds on that it'll go to court. Just my opinion. That shouldn't stop you, and it's not going to make my decision any different. But I just want you to be aware that not working together is a big deal. Due to the physical features of the lot and the location of existing structures on the lot, it would be it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the uh, currently applicable yard size requirements. Again, um, one of the positives is you're moving it over, you're getting it more compliant, more more conforming in that sense. But you're also expanding the footprint, which I have a problem with. Um, this, I typically do not. Whenever we see one of these, I typically do not like expanding footprints. I like it to keep the same and make it better, as opposed to expanding, and so that moving it over doesn't really make a bit of difference in this case. I, I, I think it's good; it's more compliant. But take adding adding space to it is less compliant. So you kind of it's, it's a wash. Um, so I have a problem with that one. And again, I'm just me. I'm one person. I'm one vote. It's important to understand that I have no more power than anybody else here. So it's really important you understand that you don't don't. But I'm just try, I try to be candid, uh, not as candid as him. But the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building and structure on the existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from the, greater than the impacts and effects of a building or a structure which conforms to the yard size requirements. Well, that's a great sentence. I don't like the sentence. I don't think it reads well. I don't I think it's confusing at best. How we've typically interpreted it, in my opinion is that, does this bother anybody? Pretty loudly it does. Um, is this going to make a big difference in values of home? Potentially. Does that affect the final decision? Not necessarily. The impacts and enlargement, expansion of a new business building or structure, and existing use of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts. And I say that an impact, even though we're not entitled to a view, it is an impact. So the entitled review is one conversation, but there is an impact. In fact, I think that's real. Uh, the applicant has not commenced construction. That's obviously easy. So uh, I, other board members care to chime in at all on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I, I think to avoid uh, falling into the paradox of more circular discussion on this topic, I think we should investigate the non-vegetative space versus building surface space. Uh, we should table this and then uh, we'll wait till we hear back. Is that a motion? 
I'd like to entertain a motion to. Okay. You just have it do through. Just go through, Ms. Boisel. Ditto. Okay. So Ms. Boisel's moved. Do we have a second on that? Second. None discussed. All in favor, put tabling. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. I would, uh, we're t at 10.30 now. Does the board want to continue with uh, the hardship variance number 2559? How does the board fill in that? I think to be fair to him, he's sat all night. I'm okay with that. I have my daughter at home this fire. Thank you. So no. What would you like to do? you want to continue or stop? Well, we've got enough. We've got enough even if you want to go, you can go if you want. Yeah, you can go. All right, so we're going to continue the meeting, uh, especially uh, given the realities. And, and you've got uh, expense there with uh, Mr. Fisher and everything else, so we're going to continue with the meeting. Um, any board member that needs to leave, they are certainly welcome to. Uh, it's past the time typically that we go. So no, no offense to take it. Thank you. I just want to confirm that you're staying. Uh, no, I have, I have You're leaving. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Crockett is leaving, so you'll that's be voting. Okay. Yep. That's absolutely fine. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure I, could, I made him. Uh, Brian, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Brian. Right. <laughs> There's a reason for 10.30, so. Yeah, you would. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next appeal is appeal number 2559, Mr. Chair. 2559, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, I forget to find my notes anyway. It's a hardship variance of request uh, for Tim <laughs> Sakarapa Sac Lane uh, by uh, Jamie Lindbergh. And it's a Citizens Matthew 17, parcel 42. Hardship variance is. Variance. So it needs to meet the four requirements. Great, Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tim Fisher from Northeast Civil, uh, representing uh, Mr. Leinberger, who's here with us this afternoon. Um, in the interest of the late hour, thank you, by, by the way, for uh, um, allowing us to go up beyond the, the typical scheduled time frame. I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, thank you. Um, we're here basically to uh, keeping this very, very simple and, and, uh, and quick. Okay. Um, Actually, we can't shut the door because the fire, stop one right. second if you don't mind. Uh, believe it or not, it's a fire code. So we'll just move the people along. Yeah, they're gone. Okay. Um, we're looking, basically, cut to the chase. We're looking for 56 square feet, a seven by eight foot bathroom that's on the second floor, completely over the footprint of the first floor on a structure that was built 125 years ago. Uh, as most of the structures in this area, uh, which is down around uh, Prout's Neck and the, the actual neck portion of it leading to Prout's. Um, and most of the houses were built at that time along the sides of the property, which is quite common everywhere, Portland and Scarborough and what have you. Uh, and uh, it just finds itself then, you know, 100 years later subject to zoning and 125 years later subject to this particular request. Uh, by issue of clarity, I should say that uh, Mr. Leinberger was here before the, well not here, but uh, before the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals 10 years ago uh, asking for a, uh, a wing on both sides of the central structure of this house. Uh, they gave him kind of half of it. Uh, they gave him one of the wings, but they didn't give him the other. And the other is where the bathroom was going and is proposed still at this point to be able to go. And again, it's only a seven by eight foot room. 
Uh, the issue we have is that's where the plumbing is on the first floor. All the bedrooms are on the second floor. You can kind of typically, uh, any of us who have families or, or even friends know that uh, when you're living upstairs and you want to get to the bathroom, going downstairs to do so isn't the most conducive uh, to try to do this. And there have been a couple of headers on the stairs, and it's just been uh, not a great situation. Uh, the, bathroom, or the bedroom that we got uh, 10 years ago, or not we, but Mr. Leinberger got 10 years ago is great. The other part of that um, is this little 7 by 8 foot uh, proposed bathroom. Uh, in a nutshell, that's it. In the interest of brevity, I'll just, uh, I've got more that I can say. But, oh, the other thing I would like to say in one respect is this is not in a shoreland zone. It's not in a resource protection zone. It's in a flood zone by two-tenths of a foot. Uh, that's that much. And that's the reason why we have to be here with a hardship variance as opposed to a practical difficulty. The, the variance overall is because we are four feet, or the house right now is built, four feet from the property line. Virtually every house hit down in that area is the same way. The photos that you've got show uh, some of the, uh, the character of the rest of that neighborhood. Uh, the house right across the street is considerably, we did that one, um, and that's considerably larger. Uh, the point being is that as far as the criteria is concerned, what we'll go through here in just a moment, it's, a, it's somewhat of an eclectic mix there. Um, most of the houses, not all of them are actually larger than this one. And uh, you can see that by the photographs. And we're just asking for this little tiny 56 square foot wing that would take care of us. Thank Given you much. That. Um, we've got two letters on this. Uh, positive. Um, one is from uh, Parker Rockefeller. Uh, I write this letter to, uh, to you in support of uh, Lindberger's application for variance at 10 Sucker Upper Lane uh, to build a second floor bathroom over the existing first floor bathroom. As a neighbor located directly across the lane, we support the plan for bathroom, which will be uh, presented to you this fall. And uh, the next one is, and his address is uh, 9 Sucker up the Lane. And thanks for the research on that. Uh, he didn't put that on there, so uh, the court took care of that first. Uh, the next one is from uh, Christopher Angel. I own the property, uh, yeah, that's 8 Sucker up the Lane. I own the property at 8 Sucker up the Lane in Scarborough. Neighbor James Limburger is seeking a yard reduction uh, variance with respect to his property at 10 Sacramento Lane to create a second floor bathroom over the existing bathroom on the first floor. I am writing to inform you that I support Mr. Limburger's application and request that the zoning board approve the application. Uh, no phone calls? No. I'll open the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak to that? I'll close the public hearing. It's a lot easier that way. Um, and we'll come back to the questions at hand the four requirements. As Mr. Fisher pointed out, the reason that this is here is because of two tenths of a foot, is that what you said? Yes. Couldn't give it away, huh? <laughs> so that's what forces it to, uh, as opposed to the last one, which was a uh, hardship, uh, the, um, uh, what's it called, I'm sorry, the great term, uh, limited reduction, which is a lot easier to meet. Uh, it forces us to the four uh, experience appeal items. So, and we just start right off with the first one, uh, land in general uh, cannot meet, uh, where do we go? Land in, in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Uh, that, Jump right in. Uh, that is correct. As is typical, the emphasis is on reasonable return. Three bedroom cottage in an area of houses, many of which are new, uh, are that, uh, that are often worth, uh, or several of them are worth well over a million dollars. Reasonable return does not necessarily mean character of the neighborhood only. Additionally, a, a cottage where all bedrooms are on the second floor and the only bathroom is on the first floor is not, imp not only impractical but unsafe. The original cottage was constructed with a cesspool, uh, then indoor plumbing, then a, a bathroom that was connected to the public sewer system. Uh, with current houses in this or any area that uh, often have more bathrooms and bedrooms, uh, to add such a facility on the second floor that contains the bedrooms is very practical, makes common sense, reduces the chance of injury sustained by people uh, needing access to a bathroom at any time of day, but particularly at night, um, and having to negotiate the stairs to do so. Okay. And the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. Uh, the existing house was constructed in 1890 and far predates zoning. Any construction on the second floor, which is completely over the first floor footprint, is due to the unique circumstances of the neighborhood where roadways, lots, and houses existed well prior to zoning. And the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood? 
uh, the addition of this small 57 square foot structure on the second floor of an existing house will not alter the character of the neighborhood other than to enhance it. The addition will even out the second story by completing the second wing, as it were, uh, to match the one that's already on the other side of the house, thereby giving the house a much better visual aesthetic in the neighborhood. And the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant of prior owner. Hardship is still be alive. Say again? Somebody from 1890 could still be alive, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the hardship is solely due to the enactment of zoning restrictions long after the construction of the house and is therefore not the result of any action taken by the homeowner uh, of the property at any <coughs> creation of that lot. Okay, pretty good. Um, anything to add on this? No, other than to reiterate what Jim had already said in that this came before the board in 2005. Um, it was denied because the board felt that there was an alternative place to um, put the uh, the bathroom. I'm not sure. I wasn't. It wasn't clear from reading the minutes whether they were indicating that they thought there was a second story location for it, or if they just felt that it could be built in the built level behind the house. I'm, I, I wasn't clear on that part, but it, 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 it got denied twice. For the same for the same thing or different? Um, again, the first time I think they felt that there was another place, and then I think the uh, appellant came back and proved that there wasn't another place, so the second time they, they denied it based on um, the, the uh, uh, first criteria. First criteria. I mean, couldn't, couldn't put the I'm sorry, could you, could you me a favor and just take the microphone and state your name and address? Jamie Leinberger, thank you for staying late tonight. Um, we couldn't flip flop the rooms because we didn't, it just didn't fit. I can't, eight by seven room, you can't put a bedroom there. So we, they just allowed us to raise the roof over an existing attic space to place another bedroom. So they gave us half, half the approval, not the other half. Okay. And uh, thank you. Any, any further questions? Uh, there might be. Uh, board comments. Yeah. Uh, I, I, um, well, on that, on that uh, number one there, um, a reasonable return to me is, is a reasonable use of the property, and, I, and I, I think that this is entirely within that scope. I don't see how anybody can say a, a bathroom on the, in, on the floor that the bedrooms are on is not reasonable use of a, of a piece of property. So I, I think that number one is easily, easily met. So if that was one of the things, Brian said that that was what they went back to the second time denied it for it. I just don't see how you can deny that. And I, Mr. Sorry. I was going to mirror that as well because I just recently stayed in a cottage without a bathroom on the second floor and it was a middle of the night death trap really. I was walking down the staircase in the pitch black and the navigator and attest to the fact that I think it's a safety issue and I think it's easily meets that criteria. Especially when you're your age. Yeah, especially when you're my age. Actually, <laughs> there's, a, there's somebody in Scarborough that died because they thought they were going down. That just broke their neck, fell on the stairs. And also, I just had a family member die from falling down the flight of stairs. Similar situation. So she was 90 years old. So there is, I can tell you that that statement's true. <laughs> yeah. It's and Mr. Fisher, in your professional opinion, um, a seven foot by eight foot bathroom, what is that size compared to other bathrooms that you've seen put in in homes? Very small. Okay, so your the request is reasonable. It's not like you're putting in some luxurious bathroom. It is a bathroom, functional bathroom. Right, and you'll see you should see a plan there um, in your packet. It's I just did. got a okay. I saw a small tub and a tiny uh, sink. It's right, and a sink. And it's it's just, just a seven by eight room. Yeah, you packing as much in there as you can, and it's still pretty small. Okay, thank you. There's actually a term for this in the in the appraisal world. It's called functional obsolescence. Um, yeah, and it actually came about because as time goes on, the world changes, and uh, even from 19, 2005 to 2015. But it, it, on an appraised value point of view, they would hit points for that because of the fact that it is functional obsolescence, not having a bathroom in the same place as bedrooms. That shouldn't be a reason for making a decision, right. but there, that is a legitimate um, issue from, from a, obviously a, a, a fairly reliable source, just being made of Freddie Mac. Yeah. I think I would balk if uh, the applicant was trying to get something more than just a bathroom if it was expanding into some a large room, but it's not. It's a functional bathroom. And um, as far as uh, the number one is concerned, my my um, my issue is, is is very similar to uh, Mr. Stark's point. Um, 
it's there's a couple of things here. Number one, it's common sense I think needs to apply. Whether or not um, you know, obviously you did your homework with your neighbors. That helps. Um, there's some common sense that applies with that reality, and we have no neighbors that have a problem with it, which is great news. Um, the uh, I believe that the functional obsolescence is enough of a reason for me to say that it meets that requirement based on the realities that we have neighbors that agree and based on the realities that we're talking about, a minor issue, two-tenths, whatever the whatever yeah. say. I just don't think it's unreasonable to make that request. Uh, as far as number two is concerned, the granting variance due to the unique circumstances of property, that's, that's obvious. It's pretty straightforward. The granting variance will not result in the central character of the neighborhood. Um, I don't see anything there. And is not a result of action, action taken by the applicant. So I have no problem with this uh, at all based on that. If I could go down, write down through everybody their opinions uh, for, the, for the record, that would be great. And get a motion. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the... Uh, it's such a it's such a small request. I know a seven by eight gym was at, Ms. Fisher was out with a seven by eight. Yes. It's a small bathroom, and I and I'm familiar with the cottage, and I think that the aesthetically it's going to look nice. Whoever did that, it kind of balances that that center wing, and so it won't, certainly won't alter the character of the neighborhood. And yeah, I think he's met all the criteria easily. Yeah, and I I see no conflict with any of these four issues. These uh, four points. Thank you. I concur. Previous board members, I see no issue with this application. Yeah, the last three points I think are uh, rubber stamps and easy to approve. The first one is the one that's more difficult, but based on that they're putting it inside the, the existing envelope for the building, they are not building over the top of it with additional space in another room. It is just to get a bathroom in. I think that proves that it's just reasonable return and not trying to maximize return. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve appeal. 2559 is presented. Second that. And second by Mr. Stark. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. Good, Good night. night. Okay, Mr. Uh, wow. Longstaff, any comments on the last uh, Anything that nope. has to do with Nope. You can check out the latest on the Higgins Beach repair if you just go to the website. That's important. Yeah, if you yep. want to see what's going on with that, that's yeah. really important. We spent a lot of time on that. Oh, right. so. Uh, board members, any oh, comments, questions, any statements for tonight? None for me. I'm just going to reiterate that about working with neighbors. Um, so this, is a, this is a hard enough job by itself without having those kind of issues, but when you don't work with your neighbors, it really causes problems. And uh, so for whatever it's worth, if you decide you need to come to a board, do your homework first, and it'll, it'll help you a lot. I guess I, I guess I do have one comment. Mr. Longstaff, I do have feelings, or at least I used to. So please be cautious around me, all right? Do I have to that? Please, please don't. I don't. I think he's serious. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Are we claiming a hostile work environment? I don't know. Yeah. No, Mar Mark I'm feeling threatened. I'm feeling threatened. <laughs> Mark has ripped out every okay. feeling I've had. Motion to close. Uh, Second. Uh, in favor? Yeah, thank you very much. Have a great night.